Hello and welcome everyone to Noman Art Jam today. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Hope you're all having a good morning or whatever time it is where you are. Uh, excited to be sculpting and making some awesome stuff with you uh, today. We have a super special guest today. Uh, founder CEO Alex Alvarez is here with me on the stream today and we're going to be making some stuff. I'm going to add Alex to the stream now. Hello, Alex. How are you doing? Hello. I'm good. How are you? Good. Welcome to the stream. Welcome Thank to your you. first art jam. I know. I'm a little nervous. No, you'll be fine. I'm excited to, to make some stuff and kind of hang out and jam and uh, yeah. So as we always do kind of the, at the beginning of the streams, kind of just kind of talk through maybe a little bit of what we're going through. You've already got a couple people saying how amazing your camera is. You look great. <laughs> just, you were, we were talking before the stream. You have a, you got a nice new setup. I got a, uh, yeah, it's a Sony a7 III. I was researching like why some people online just have these insane looking yeah. webcams and it's not a webcam is turns out is the secret like just get a regular camera with <laughs> hdmi out connected to this little elgato usb stick and and there you yeah. go so no more logitech webcams for me yeah it looks amazing i i immediately as soon as i saw you i was like okay i definitely need to start upgrading my camera <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be doing that soon yeah it's, uh, it's a little too high res so it's like well you look sure great I, yeah uh, shave <laughs> <laughs> looks awesome well today we're going to just start making some stuff alex is going to be doing some environment work and i'll be doing some character work i've also been deciding whether or not i'm going to be finishing up some projects that i've started previously on the stream uh in case this is your first time joining we have all of our art jams archived on youtube uh so you can go to our youtube uh channel or our youtube playlists and you can see all those there uh, as as if you're interested, there's probably 100 hours of art jams on, on our YouTube channel at this point, which is awesome. Um, I wanted to kind of jump into your process before we get started, uh, mm -hmm. because you seem, one of the things as I've, I've watched you work a lot and worked with you, you are super, super organized with everything you do. Like you use a lot of shelves, you have really great management uh, mm -hmm. with how you're doing stuff. And I think that that kind of seems to be a big part of your process. So I was hoping that you could maybe walk us through why you work that way, how you work that way, mm -hmm. and maybe how you'll be using that today. Uh, sure. I think... Uh, should we add you, your camera to the stream? Or uh, should we... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can just share my... So I'm just going right. to open up uh, Maya. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, a few years ago, I got into doing environment stuff and kind of realized that having a library would be super useful because there were a lot of things I was kind of doing over and over. Um, mm -hmm. And so these days, you know, I think it's become a little bit more common. And so you mm -hmm. obviously, you know, kit bashing is like a, a really popular thing now, um, mm -hmm. which is the same idea, which is like having a library and libraries have been around for a long time. But um, mm. having my own. And, uh, so I use Maya shelves for that. So like, if I just click this button, for example, it just imported a scene. Most of these buttons on my shelves are just importing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's cool, like the new version of bridge from Quixel, like this is Quixel bridge. Uh, you can now import your own stuff into bridge. So you can use bridge as like your own asset manager. That's cool. Which, which I haven't tried using my own stuff in here yet, but obviously like, you know, bridge is awesome. And, uh, and it's like really nice the way it organizes things and allows you to manage a library. So that's fairly new. Um, mm -hmm. So I haven't played with it. So like in Maya, I just have, you know, like I click this button, which just imported an empty scene. But mm -hmm. if I go and, you know, render it, um, it's just a blank scene. Okay. But the thing is, is that if anytime I'm starting anything, I click that button first. So like, right. I don't have to set up a sky dome and set up a light and set up a redshift material. I'm using redshift, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, as my renderer, um, just because it's, you know, interactive and pretty quick. And um, you can also navigate inside the render view window, which is nice. Oh, I didn't know you could navigate that way. That's cool. Yeah, which is really cool. So I don't use it as much because usually I have my render view window on a, another monitor. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'd be working inside here to navigate and generally and just glance over to the other monitor where this is always updating because Redshift is 
fast enough they just kind of always have it up full screen on a on a another monitor i have three monitors so one which is a 24 inch monitor for this the render view window and then i have mm -hmm. a 27 inch monitor for like hyper shade and other maya windows mm -hmm. and then this is like my main monitor so basically like uh i hit that button it imports a blank scene and i can start importing other stuff so these uh shelves just have things that are useful uh assets like i've got a bunch of photogrammetry stuff in here um different uh, materials from uh, mega scans that i are kind of like already set up for maya um like you know a button that imports like let's say i go in here and open the redshift render view window again let's make it a little smaller let's zoom out a little bit of that and so if i were to let's say import like I go to rocks and import this rock. And so this is a rock that uh, is going to end up popping up in the render view window once I just turn that on. So now you can see there's a rock there. And if I want there to be water in the scene, I can just click on ground and click on water. And then that's just importing a ground plane mm -hmm. that has a water material on it um that i made but it's like if i want water in the scene instead of having to manually like how do i make a water shader and you know remember that and make it from scratch it's just super easy to just have things available that i've already done yeah, it's and like it's your kit mashing elements that you've created like custom made kit mesh on shelves that's pulling in files that's cool yeah and so it, it just makes it simple um and so for blocking out scenes it's just uh, a nice way to to work and so the like miscellaneous objects is more photogrammetry you know some leaves twigs like these are things from mega scans so like mega scan mm -hmm. walls mega scan concrete mm -hmm. uh paint effects stuff people so if i just want a stand-in character in a scene then you have one i've got one and so you got a, a couple different options there which is cool and those are all scanned with like photogrammetry like textures too uh yeah and so oh. i don't have any photogrammetry of people that i've done just because to do people well you need multiple cameras okay. um like static objects like rocks are easier with photogrammetry but uh having you know people for environments is useful just as a scale reference and yeah i, I just need one of those the hooded dude with the staff sick man exactly yeah, you yeah, that's a perfect uh, for all environments. That's like the classic environment guy. Yeah, totally awesome. Um, got a bunch of plants, um, uh, rocks. I've got like larger rocks as well as like rocks to scatter. Plants from Speed Tree, tree trunks, a lot of trees from Speed Tree, and some from Onyx, which is a tree program that's been around since forever. Mm -hmm. um, a few VDBs for just smoke and clouds, like a bunch of terrains from World Machine um which is a procedural train software that's really really cool um and so it's just basically you know all very very organized which is nice but it's all i think the interesting thing about your pipeline that you're kind of showing is that it's all different like it's all different programs that you've played around with and you found like something you like out of that you prep it and you set it like in a place so you can easily pull it in so that you're not having to to go back and forth between all of the the other programs every time like the, right like the, the big point that i heard you say is you know setting up a water shader every time remembering how to do that from scratch every time when you could just pull something in and it has that already like attached to it that's a super smart workflow um mm -hmm. to do it reminds me a lot of like um you know matte painters and concept artists where i don't remember who it was but he was he was an artist who was saying like every time i i I work on a project, you know, I'm probably gonna have to pull some photos and I'm gonna have to cut something out of a photo or whatever. And every time I do that, I cut that out. And while I'm working, I save that to another folder. So if it's now I've got all these folders that I've already done of, of rocks and trees and people and, you know, environment textures and all this other stuff. So you're working in a way that feels very, uh, it, it feels like very customized to you, which I think is cool because it's, um, you know, you're 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 using so many different programs, but you're really streamlining the way that you're 
uh, able to use them, which is awesome. Uh, yeah, it's it's just trying to like avoid redoing the same thing again. Mm -hmm. You know that that's the main thing. So it's like because if you're just having fun playing around in 3D, but every time you need to make something, you need to stop and go to Speed Tree and make a tree from scratch and import it. You know, then the process to make an image from scratch is going to take a really long time. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is normal because all of these things I did eventually do that. Like all of these trees are from Speed Tree, where mm -hmm. I did go in and you know browse the library of Speed Tree stuff and import presets and play with presets and then like export them and get the materials and shaders set up in Maya for Redshift. And, you know, like I, I did all of that work, mm -hmm. but now I did it. You know, enough that I now have like just general tree types that I could use. So right. I'm just like, you know, oh, I want some bamboo in a scene. And I just click that button and it's going to import a bunch of bamboo. Mm -hmm. You know, and so now I've got that geometry in here, which if I go back to Redshift and render that, then that'll pop up once it's uh, done processing the, you know, we're in the shade. So let's grab the sun <laughs> and let's uh, rotate the sun a little bit so we can see those guys. As you're rotating, there's a question that came in, which is, you have all these kind of custom shelves and and stuff. Do you have any issues with bugs as like new releases of Maya come up? Like every time there's a new version, do you have issues with that? Uh, I haven't yet. You know, like these shelves, some of these shelves I, I made, you know, probably four years ago mm -hmm. um, and I've added buttons to them since with other things. But the thing is, all, all these shelves are, are they're literally just importing stuff. So if I open the shelf editor and I want to see like what is one of these buttons. So like, mm -hmm. let's say I click on the one that's, uh, you know, uh, this one, which is going to import palm trees. So if I click on it, you can see it's got an icon. So I rendered, I did a render of the palm trees and then mm -hmm. exported as a, you know, a, a PNG file which goes here. It's like your Maya icons directory in your mm -hmm. preferences. And then if I look at the command that's associated with it, it's just a standard, you know, Maya mel command, file dash import dash type Maya binary. And then it's got the name of the file. And so the only thing is that the buttons are importing a Maya binary file that is on my E drive. So okay. that's the only thing is that the, my shelves ex require all of my assets to be on an E drive. So like if I go to somebody else's computer, you know, like, mm -hmm. and I put all of my assets on like a drive that's not E, then I would have to change the text for every single button. So I just yeah. always make sure that I'm on an E drive. So if I mount an external on, on, on a different computer, I'll just mount it as E. Right. And then basically, uh, so since this is standard Mel, like it's it's going to work unless Maya were ever to change what the command is to import, which they never have. That's good. Um, so all of these, um, you know, are pretty bulletproof from that perspective, which is cool. And then you can see how if I just want to like switch now and show you like a different one. Let's say I import like a, a cliff face. Um, the Megascans bridge now has a bunch of cliff faces in it too, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But now I can just go to render view and hit render. And like, I was able to make a new scene so quickly without right. having to set up a sky dome and set up the lights and set up Redshift to be my renderer. So like, I would say like the button that gets clicked on the most is just that, that empty scene. scene yeah. Button. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah, most of these assets are, you know, good for like mid range to background. Like I don't have like 8K or textures mm -hmm. on these things just so that I can import a bunch of stuff and have it perform okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, I was gonna ask like if you're gonna be able to import stuff so easily, is it like a concern that you're gonna import too much stuff and it's gonna overwhelm your computer? Or... Um, not because uh, most of these things have been like all my photogrammetry stuff has been remeshed in ZBrush. Okay. So none of them are that many polygons, so they're all kind of fine. Mm -hmm. um, because obviously, like when you do a scan for you know the first time with something like PhotoScan or Reality Capture, it's going to be kind of heavy. Mm -hmm. um, but then I go in and um, remesh it. So if I import, let's say, like some tree trunks, and just sort of like get these 
to be like that. Then, you know, these are 35,000 polygons, 76, 89, which isn't that many because the original scan was maybe like 20 million. Sure. You know, yeah, so they, have, they, different. they have been remashed and so like they're totally fine. So like these tree trunks, they're just tree trunks. They're not, they don't have like leaves and stuff, but you know, useful if I just need to have something in the near ground, mm -hmm. you know, then maybe I don't want that one, but maybe I just want this one to start blocking out a scene. So this holds up pretty well. Yeah. Because yeah, it's, got a, so. it's got a 4K texture on it. So I could actually get probably a bit closer to it. Mm -hmm. So when you're starting well. a new piece, so if, you know today we're going to try to block out a piece and start getting you know composition and lighting and mood and all that set up. Uh, yeah. How do you start? Do you start by just importing stuff and playing with it, or do you start by like what's your workflow there? Um, kind of. I've got uh, a lot of stuff. I've the images I've made have just been from goofing around. So mm -hmm. like importing stuff, or maybe like I'm making an asset. Um, for my library, but then while I'm testing if it wor it's working, all of a sudden I end up importing a bunch of stuff and it becomes like, you know, an image. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that uh, if I were to look, like go to my website and go in here, um, you know, like <clears throat> something like this one, I was just making world machine terrains for my shelf. Mm -hmm. just as like presets and just in testing them out i ended up with this render because all this is is this whole scene is two planes hmm. um because it's one plane for the water right and then it's one plane for this terrain that has a mm -hmm. displacement map on it from world machine mm -hmm. um and then back there there's another plane and so i was just and then you know the little boat i just google searched boats and sure. found an image of one and just comped it in, in photoshop so a lot of images are just made from like having fun and, and goofing around. And then like the textures that are on, on here, the nice thing with World Machine is that it allows you to export ma masks. So mm -hmm. I have a layered shader. So there's just like three mega scans materials that are being layered based on the masks that are from uh, World Machine. So like, for example, something like that, you know, if I go, I have my World Machine shelf up right now. And if I click on one of these, it's going to open this terrain up. And then it's got a height field, which is a Maya thing to preview. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the uh, height fields import a little funny. So I just need to fix that. There so you, you can see I've got this little train in here. And then that's uh, just a world machine train that I made procedurally. Um, but then if I go and render it, Right now, it's processing the textures. Mm. Redshift just has to do that once per asset, and then it stores it on disk. And the next time I would import that asset, it would render it super quickly. Mm. OK, cool. And so you can see this is not textured, so it doesn't necessarily look all that exciting. Mm -hmm. um, if I change the light just to make it look a little better, there you go. Oh, yeah, there we go. And so yeah, it's like it's pretty cool. And so now I've yeah. got this terrain. And so basically it's exported from World Machine with uh, a displacement map. So that's what's creating all of the detail that you see, because it is just a flat plane that's rendering. Let me show you that. So if I take the height field, which is a previewer and turn it off, this is actually what's in the scene, just a plane. And so, yeah. but it, it yeah. renders to look like that. But Very since cool. Maya doesn't preview displacements, um, mm -hmm. there's a texture, deformer that allows you to do that, but by default it doesn't. So I often just use this uh, height field node because um, the height field node in Maya allows you to preview display flat displacements, which is kind of cool. Hmm. So like if I was so like I could just have this right now and just be like, let's turn this into an image. Right, exactly. So start right. there. Like I could start here and be like, all right, well now what's going to go off to the distance, like maybe mm -hmm. some, you know, just to be lazy, maybe water. So I'll just import that water plane, mm -hmm. which is in here and scale that up a little bit, scale that up like to 50,000. So it's pretty big and then bring my, you know, render back. So now we can see oh, there that there's, is. you know, water in the scene. Now, obviously with something like, you know, I can bring that a little higher. 
<clears throat> the horizon back there, <laughs> excuse me, you need to deal with uh, atmospheric fog because right. as things get further away to the horizon, they just kind of like fade to the horizon uh, air color. Yeah, yeah like kind of the distance. Yeah. And then the nice thing is my, uh, my little empty scene button. Uh, when it creates the scene, it does create the uh, environment fog node. It's just off. And so if I go in here to fog and go to the attribute editor, then I can just turn it on and then fog will come into the scene. Then you can just adjust it from there. Yeah, it obviously changed the scattering and the intensity and sure. all that stuff. Um, so yeah, so like if I wanted to turn this into an illustration, then it would just be a matter of figuring out my composition first. Because mm -hmm. um, I'll always start with composition. Because since I do a lot of like stills, mostly, like I don't really do animations, then mm -hmm. I only want to work on what the camera sees. And so I kind of like figure out where my camera is in my composition and kind of lock that. So I don't worry about stuff that you're not going to see. Right. And then once I've got this kind of blocked out, then I can figure out what I need to texture. You know, because like if this train was going to be like a background train, like mm -hmm. let's say like back there, um, I might not need to texture it. Yeah, because it's it's fine for what you're what you're going to see in that final image. Yeah, because especially if I end up, you know, color grading it and using depth of field, and you know, that's going to be in the fog a little bit. So that's why, like, a lot of these. Uh, World machine files aren't textured. I, I might be confusing people with that. It's like because you're seeing the colors. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> but the colors um, are because I have a layered texture. Uh, so it's like three layered shaders: one that's green, one that's blue, and one that's yellow, and one that's white. So there's four actually, and each one has its own mask. So I could go, go into the shader if I open up HyperShade. And then select the shader that's on this guy. Select material from object. I'm just going to bring hypershade over here. So this is the material that's on that uh, terrain, and it looks really big because it's it's layered. And so you can see if I zoom in here that there is a uh, a, a blend node mm -hmm. because it's blending a bunch of uh, Redshift materials together. So I have one material for deposition, one for wear, one for the flat areas, one for the areas that are sloping, one for erosion. It's 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 a whole bunch. But each one is just a flat color. So if I select right. with you know, a mask, one of these, you can see like this one is yellow, this one is brown. Mm -hmm. So if I go to the one that's brown and I make it, you know bright orange you'll see what that's going to change so i could but so i could just map a texture to that and then instead of being you instead know yellow color. exactly so it's uh so it's kind of cool it, yeah it is cool i think it's it, even though it seems like you're saying it seems like it's confusing because it's like where's the texture right uh mm -hmm. it's actually just a lot of masks being yeah you know, being manipulated that are that are kind of altering the, the colors of, of what you're seeing. Uh, yeah. which is which is awesome because it's also you know, when you start using masks and color, it's a lot more it's it's easier to change that stuff on the fly rather than going into Photoshop or some of the program to change to change it. Right. Totally. And so like and the nice thing is the masks come from world machine. So like I don't have to make them. So if I look at this like layered shader and uh, I grab one of the masks that are in here and I view it. So that's what an erosion flow mask looks like from world machine. Um, and so we'll which is on its own, <laughs> which is rad looking. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's a mask. So basically anywhere that the flow is, I can now use that as a mask to assign a texture into that, uh, into that spot. Right. Um, so, you know, it's so, so, you know, getting textures into these things is can be fairly straightforward. Like if I just went to the flat areas and just, you know, took a regular file texture and stuck it into color, another one for roughness, another one for bump, then there you go. If I wanted to put mega scans 
materials in there, you know, you mm -hmm. just got to concentrate a little harder because you're importing a mega scan material. And so I would be swapping this shader with like a mega scans shader. Right. And so therefore I could have, you know, really nice, you know, uh, materials from in here because obviously uh, there are amazingly cool materials mm -hmm. in here. So like, let's go back to that. So if I wanted like this rocky soil ground material to be what's on the slopes, I can do that. It's just swapping the shaders that are in the layered shader. And setting something like this up, you can see it's kind of time consuming because yeah. it's just like a lot of nodes. And so that's the cool thing is that for all of these uh, assets that are on these shelves, like it's already kind of done. Yeah, I was going to say each one of those buttons has a setup like that already done. So it's a, it's like a lot of prep work to you know to get go through that to set it up, download it all, make sure it looks good the first time you're using it, yeah. saving but, it, putting it as a shelf, and then you can easily import it. Right, but it's not a lot of prep work. Like if I went to World Machine and made a new one, sure. I already have these shaders, so I wouldn't start from scratch in Maya. You know, right. like if I made a new terrain in World Machine and then I exported the six maps that create that terrain and the masks, I would then just open one of the materials I've already made and just replace mm -hmm. the textures. Right. So that I, so like I kind of never would uh, remake, you know, this from scratch. Like I could just edit it, but but it's easier to just swap the six textures that are in here. Right. You absolutely. Just, just find all the file texture nodes. You know. Like there's one height 4K, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's where the height map goes, mm -hmm. you know. And so it's just looking around deposition. That's where the deposition map goes, and I can look at that one and see another mask from World Machine. So, <clears throat> so cool. yeah, I think uh, that's kind of if I start an illustration, I'm going to start maybe by just playing, or mm -hmm. you know, another thing which I really want to do. Um, I've got all of my Inktober drawings, right. Yes, I remember those in October. Yes, that was a busy month. Yeah, it was a busy month for you. Dude. Um, but it was awesome just because I get so busy with Noman that I, you know, don't sit and focus as much as I, I wish I could on making art. Mm -hmm. So Inktober, this was the second time I did it, and it was awesome just to really be like, that's all I'm going to do this month is go through the whole process of doing thumbnails and thinking about the word and, and doing images. So now I've got like, you know, um, 31 images where all of these I could now turn into, you know, an illustration in Maya. So yeah. hopefully my hope is with the art jam is that this is goes okay. And I'm somewhat interesting <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and maybe we can do more of these and maybe I can and yeah. try and start making some of these into, into, uh illustrations in maya because i think that would be a workflow that would be cool for people to see is like how do you start mm -hmm. with a drawing and end up with a uh, a 3d render yeah for sure i mean i'm i would be super interested in that i think that a lot of other people would be interested in watching that kind of come to life uh you know we've, we've done a lot of stuff on stream where it's you know i'm sculpting from scratch or we're starting you know seeing some other people's process but we haven't seen too many um environment pieces in, in the, the stream. So I think it'd be awesome to see how a bigger piece and even a piece that has characters in it maybe as well uh, mm -hmm. would come together. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, ultimately some of these are easier than others. You mm -hmm. know, it's mm -hmm. like, uh, it's a matter of like how large scale of a scene is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like something like this in the end is just a bunch, it's primarily a bunch of trees that I would make in speed tree, but like I don't have trees in my library that look like these trees. Right. So a lot of these, my library might not be useful. Mm -hmm. So like, if I look at this one and be like, all right, I need to make, you know, like these kind of look like eucalyptus trees. Sure. And so that's one cool thing about learning speed tree a few years ago and getting into environment stuff is I started kind of learning a little bit about different types of trees and like, what's a sycamore tree, what's a maple tree, what's a birch uh, and so forth. So that I could look mm -hmm. at this and be like, all right, this looks like eucalyptus. So if I can go to speed tree and search for eucalyptus presets, then that'll give me like a start point. Right. 
And then I can see, all right, this is a terrain, but based on the lighting, it's pretty dark. So I'll probably use mega scan stuff on the ground. The whole ground is just going to be a plane. So this is going to be some trees, plane, fog. Um, there's a campfire. So to make a fire, now I'm going to need to use something that allows me to do fire. But I've been telling you about that new program, Embergen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that I sounds could, awesome. So I could make the fire in Embergen and make the smoke. I think that you know, there's probably a lot of people watching who haven't seen Embergen. That's probably true. I'm going to show it for two seconds. Because, <laughs> dude. You were telling me about it last night. I haven't seen it. Well, there you go. Dude, look at this. So is that just a preset of like a This is higher? just the default scene that opens when you launch Embergen. OK. And then if I grab the emitter, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, it's like super real time. It's crazy. Dude. Wow. So like I'd be like, all right, let's scale this up a little bit. Let's move this down. You know, like anytime you're dealing with fluids, there's going to be mm -hmm. bounds. Mm -hmm. Like the fluid's only calculating inside that box. OK. Yeah, yeah. So, and you can scale the box. So if I take this primitive and like lower it down a little bit, so it's kind of exiting the box, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, just that looks cool. Yeah, it's like this is just what Embergen opens by default when you launch it, mm -hmm. and then I could export this as a VDB sequence to Maya, and then there you go. I've got like you know a campfire. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I see how that would already be perfectly useful for what you're what you're looking at and you were talking about torches before you know i mean obviously it's is it just fire or is it other types of effects as well uh it comes with all these presets so and again okay. i'm i'm new to embergen i just sort just of tried uh, it. yeah just playing i was browsing it. i think i did a google search for fire vdb and mm -hmm. then it took me to a cg channel article that jim wrote about uh embergen and uh, so it's got all these presets. It's still in beta, but it's still working pretty well. Mm -hmm. So if I look at, uh, like, where are the dry ice ones? The dry ice ones are really, really cool. Oh, yeah. You were telling me I could, like, go across the floor or stairs or. Yeah, that's awesome. It's like, dude. <laughs> that's super cool because <laughs> like you know I, i've played with fluids in maya and obviously they're incredibly powerful but they're pretty slow mm -hmm. and the way it looks in viewport is nothing like this right and so uh yeah i highly if anybody watching this thinks this looks cool just go to embergen's website and download it there's a free trial like i'm currently using the free trial and you can just play but the nice thing is look how few nodes are in here yeah it, it seems relatively simple yeah and look, when I move this around, like just yeah, it's like actually, speed. yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> that's one of those so, things where I get this is neat, dude. And uh, and then it's like if I want to like add a collider, I can be like, oh well, there's the simulation node. It has a thing called colliders. So to drag mm -hmm. that. Let's make a collider that's a primitive. And then all of a sudden, it's like, look at that. Right, right, pushing it all around. It's like what? Yeah, that's very intuitive. Oh, yeah. you're making like interesting like smoke rings. Like it's that's actually really cool. <laughs> just like <laughs> you could play around just with that for a long time. Yeah. So like I was gonna, you know, Friday, Saturday, I was gonna like, you know, figure out like what kind of uh illustration or something I could make for today. And then I just went down this embergen rabbit hole and lost my Saturday. <laughs> But it's so cool. So like the 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 limitation right now is uh, importing geometry. It doesn't support importing animated geometry. Okay. Um, and it's uh, and there's an issue right now where when you import stuff from Maya or any software, the scale gets all screwed up, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so meaning that if I let's say go out back to where's that image I had? Um, well, here I'll just open it up from. So if I look at this. <clears throat> the way I'd probably want to do the campfire is mm -hmm. uh, I'd make a uh, geometry of logs, right, to be the campfire. Right. And then I'd, you know, merge that or uh, combine it. So it's just a single mesh for my logs for the campfire. And then I'd want to export that geometry to Embergen and set that on fire. Mm -hmm. So which you can do. So you can import geometry inside here. And so you can see that if I, you know, go to a shape and say type, you can specify, you know, uh, all of these choices. But if I go out here, you can see I can make a mesh. 
And if I mm -hmm. choose a mesh, then I can uh, import open import a mesh, mesh file and op open it an OBJ. But the thing is, is that the bug right now, which supposedly is going to be fixed pretty soon, is when you import the uh, your OBJ, it scales it to the size of this uh, non-proportionally to the size of this volume. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's going to kind of screw up your, what you're trying your, to do. Yeah. But supposedly the next version that's going to come out soon, 0.75, is going to resolve those issues, which means that I could put the campfire in Maya, get it set up, export it to Embergen. It'll pop up at the right scale, set it on a fire, and then export an, a VDB sequence of the fire with the smoke. And then when I import it into Maya, it'll be exactly the correct scale, ready to put a shader on it and render. Hmm. So I used to avoid putting fluids into my scenes, meaning smoke, rolling smoke, all that kind of stuff, fire, just because of the time it would take to, to create it. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like we finally have like a easy to use fluids tool. Yeah, I was gonna say like now it seems like you could easily do that. So I mean I haven't been looking at the comments, but I imagine somebody in there has got to be like, dude. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are like, what's the software? This is awesome. It's so cool. And like the nice thing is there's um you know, there's a lot of presets which you can then take apart. And so like Maya comes with presets, but the presets aren't very good. Right. Like, look at that. Yeah. Every every preset you've opened is very cool already. Like that is awesome. So just the fact that in viewport, it's mm -hmm. not only the performance is so high, like the rendering in viewport's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. So once you get this over into Redshift, obviously you'll have to make a Redshift volume shader and, and set up the ramps mm -hmm. to control the shading, but that's pretty in interactive in Redshift. Yeah. Redshift is known for rendering volumes really fast. Um, so yeah, it's just like, so I was just going through all these presets, you know, mm -hmm. this weekend and just being like, what's this one? What's this one? <laughs> this one's cool, this one's cool. Because that's kind of how you learn. You just kind of you poke know. around, like explore something and see like what, what they're doing. So yeah, this one is just like a little cloud generator. Oh, okay. So it's like very easily just be like, yeah, that works. And then export that as a VDB, just as a static VDB. It doesn't have to be an animated sequence. And then you just like gonna go through here and find the nodes that are affecting the forces. Mm -hmm. you know, that are making this move and then just like randomize seed values so that next time you sim it, the cloud's going to look a little different. And then you could just make a library of that. clouds. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what I love about your process that you've been showing is how you, how you kind of use Maya as like this hub of where you're going to bring everything in you're using the tools and finding all this really cool stuff and you're like all right i'm going to take this i love this i'm going to take this and put it you know make it so i can easily access it and everything else that i'm doing yeah i think it, it's it's definitely important to you know just uh you need to know like your what your hub is mm -hmm. and so like let's say it's maya or blender or whatever like you gotta get that get comfortable with that. But in the world we live in today, there's so many cool tools out there that plug into whatever your hub is. Mm -hmm. And so whether that's Substance or ZBrush or World Machine or Gaia, or, you know, there's just a lot of tools. But the nice thing is that generally those tools are smaller than your hub. Mm -hmm. So like Maya is the biggest one that takes the longest to learn. Mm -hmm. But once you know it, learning ZBrush is not going to take as long as learning Maya or learning Substance Painter or learning, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so I found that while I can in Maya make all sorts of things, like you can make trees in Maya using paint effects, but they're not nearly as, uh, there's not nearly as much control as there is in something like Speed Tree. Mm -hmm. The interactivity isn't there. The wind animation in Maya for paint effects is a little slow. So once I decided I really want to make trees that actually look good, then it's like mm -hmm. learn speed tree, but learning speed tree is fun and it's really interactive. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so like I've over time learned a few different programs. And uh, the nice thing is I kind of generally, once you know something, it tends to change very slowly from that point forward. 
Mm. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's like, I think ZBrush from 10 years ago to today obviously has added a bunch of really, really useful stuff, but the interface is basically the same. Yeah, the interface, the way you manipulate things, the way you save things, the way you the way you actually like interact with the program is is more or less the same thing, right? So yeah. it's kind of getting over that initial hurdle of of learning the program, learning how it thinks, learning how it, you know, how it functions. And then once you get there, you know, you you can learn how to use it and and then as it upgrades, you just figure out it's like, you know, you're just figuring out how to add like one ingredient once they add new stuff, but learning how to like the, to do the big part is, is a difficult thing. So yeah. yeah. It's, and it's uh, fun to learn to do new stuff like that. I think so. I mean, I, I think a lot of them, you know, ZBrush maybe takes a little longer because it is pretty deep, but I think standalone tools like world machine and speed tree, it's like, give yourself a week with speed tree, give yourself a week with world machine. Ember Gen, I gave myself a weekend and I like, I kind of understand the basics of it. Mm -hmm. Like definitely less time than like, oh, I'm gonna go learn Houdini to make sure. fire. Like that's not necessarily a weekend. No, that's um, a that's a much bigger endeavor for sure. Yeah, more powerful for sure. Sure. But like, yeah. but but what are your, you know, if, if I'm just making illustrations and I, I you know, just for fun. Um so yeah, so I think uh like there's a lot of you know, images in here that luckily aren't like huge as far as like uh the mm -hmm. expanse of how much geo is in here mm -hmm. you know it's like watching your streams i'm sure you could make this probably in just one stream yeah yeah i think it's you know a character bus and like a creature bus i think that that's achievable um so so yeah i've got a few in here this is for serum a little plague doctor mm -hmm. um like this one obviously is just one mesh another ground plane couple stand-in characters so it's it's fairly simple mm -hmm. um this one would be a little bit more work because it goes farther back mm -hmm. yeah so absolutely. like I'd have, I'd have to figure out the ground and all the little ground cover and bushes and grasses and things that are along that edge and then obviously it's not just a you know head but it's like a whole body basically so Trying to figure out the whole creature, what that would look like. Um, this one so, would probably take a little bit of time, but I like I that guess... one though. I think that'd be a fun one. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. I like the the storytelling. I like the the shadows and the lighting in that one. And but yeah, that one. I mean, that you were saying mega scans. You could maybe use some of that library. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, I'd block this out and once it's blocked out with primitives and simple shapes, you know, I'd pretty much just jump over to bridge and then just start looking for surfaces and just mm -hmm. being like, all right, what is this? It's a bunch of stone walls. And then <clears throat> obviously you've got a lot of that inside here. Mm -hmm. So we can go to stone, castle. And then can basically start, you know, looking at some of these textures that are in here, and see like, oh, maybe that's one of the mm -hmm. textures I'll use. So you kind of just save that and start moving, like creating a new, like almost kit bash, a new set of things you're going to use specifically for that mm -hmm. project. Right. So it's kind of like you know people are used to you know making pinterest boards of reference and so here mm -hmm. you just go through a bridge and just figure out what are all the materials and you know i have a pretty big texture library that i've built over the years mm -hmm. um but all of that was based on you know photography you know like right. shooting photos on cloudy days of different materials and surfaces as well as texture libraries that i purchased and you know but none of them they were all generally based off of still 2d photography so i think that like the quality of the mega scans bridge library is so ridiculous and it's so yeah. huge it's like over ten thousand assets now mm -hmm. that it's almost and it's all photogrammetry based right so they look so good so now it's kind of like for anybody that's texturing especially if you want things to look realistic if you're doing like photo real texturing it's such an amazing start point yeah it, it really is it is like an amazing like 
starting point. It's a it can add stuff to the background. You could obviously use it as hero assets, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely a really cool you know addition. And there's just so much more going into it now, which is awesome. Yeah, it's like I think at the beginning of Mega Scans, there was the worry because the library wasn't very big that mm. uh, everybody's stuff is going to look the same because everybody you know is going to sure. texture a wall and be like, oh, I know what texture that is. Yeah, I've seen I've seen that one before. But the library is getting so so big because they have a team of 150 people now. You know, ever wow. since they got acquired by Epic, mm -hmm. and uh, and so they have this huge team of people that are like scanning scanning the world. And so the library is going to end up getting so big that the chances of you being able to be like, oh, I know that texture, oh, I know that surface. You know, it's 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 that's maybe a little more true for like the assets because mm -hmm. if I jump over here, and you know, it's like, oh, I need a campfire. So here's this one, which is cool, but I think that's so specific, that ring with that one log in it, that if I yeah. use that as a hero piece in a scene, I think anybody who's used bridge would be like, oh, I know where you got that. Oh, I've seen that before. Yeah, yeah so there's, you know, I think, uh, look, they just added all these swords. Oh, it's funny. Cool. Well, I'll probably use those at some point. <laughs> oh, I recognize this. This was in that, uh, the medieval village. Uh, oh yeah, you were just telling me about that thing you watched. Yeah, so cool. But this is definitely in there in a couple yeah. spots. Um, yeah, one of the I think it, that looks like Shane Shane Hessler medieval scan world scan they did uh, looks awesome. Hi Shane, hope you're doing well. Um, yeah, no, there that demo was amazing. Watched it twice. Pretty inspiring. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so for a lot of these assets, I think you know, I, yeah, they used a lot of these to make the thatched roof houses. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I think if I was you know making something like this, I'd block it out in three D mm -hmm. um, in Maya, and then uh, probably rely as much as I could on Mega Scans if I was just doing this for fun for myself, trying to get it done in a day, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a more intense production way of doing it where you're not going to rely maybe on mega scans and everything's going to be hand sculpted in ZBrush and hand textured in Mari or substance. Then now that's not like a one day turnaround. That's maybe like right. you're going to spend a week or two on it. Yeah, absolutely. Which makes more sense for, you know, different applications, but not necessarily for a, just a personal still for fun. Yeah. Not, not something for, for that. I mean, I think it's interesting, like all the all, you know, personal projects. Like, I've seen some people go huge on personal projects and make it like a big thing. But it, I think it's kind of finding a goal of what your personal project is. Is it to learn a new software? Is it to build a kit? Is it to just have fun? Is it to you know, what's the point of some of it? Yeah. So yeah, if you're if you're gonna make something that's just you know for yourself and for fun, and then then use whatever's out there, right? Which is cool. I just saw a uh, comment just asking if these were done digitally. These are all drawings on paper. So these are all like just regular Strathmore drawing paper with Copic markers. Um, and I can see this one. There's a little bit of white pencil on there probably. And, oh, yeah. uh, and I got a, like white gel pens are really good just mm. for highlights. But a couple of these, not many, I think maybe three of these images I actually blocked out in Maya first. To, to like, get like perspective or something? Yeah, like this one, let's see if I can find it. This one is for Roswell. So let's see, I got reference, layout. Yeah, you can see my Maya block out for this one. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a Maya render. Just kind of get it, get it started. Uh, yeah, I did a, let's see, where's the... Um, I guess I don't have the scan of the thumbnail. All of these, like you'll see if I go in, let's go to one of these. You can see my, see my thumbnails. Mm -hmm. So for every day, for every word, I kind of thought about things that came to mind, did some sketches with a Prismacolor just on a grid paper, and then generally would jump to scanning this thumbnail, printing it out at four by five inches, and then using tracing paper to then trace on top of that to block it out at the right size and then do the drawing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then for a couple of them, just because I'm not great at perspective, to be honest. And so for this one, this thumbnail had a guy on a motorcycle and I just wanted to get the perspective right. Mm -hmm. um, and so this one ended up blocking out in 3D. I mean, I think well, that's awesome that you're combining the tool set of, you know, I'm using, I know I want it to be 2D, but I also am going to, you know, say, you know what, I this is an area that I'm not super comfortable in, or this is something I don't feel you know, I, I need a little help here, so I'm just going to set it up real quick, and then I'll go back to the tools I was using. And that's where my shelves, like, were, were super uh, handy, because for certain mm -hmm. ones, like, if I try and find one that I know I use reference for, let's see, here, scans, website posts. Um, yeah, like, this one, you know, I just wanted to, like, get some quick perspective mm -hmm. lighting reference on that one. So if I go out to here, and that one is for weary, and then if I open the layout file, that opening? It's not. So let me just go here to, let's see, personal artwork, Inktober 2020, weary layout. Yes. And then scans. Oh, that's for a different one. Sorry. That's for. <laughs> This guy. It's just a, yeah, there you go. So that one is for da, 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 website posts. That's for this one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the relatively simple blockouts. You're mostly using it for, per, per you know, perspective and depth mm -hmm. and you know basic lighting of what it's going to look like and it's you know starting with composition and kind of working your way to to what the final product is and i think that's awesome that you're kind of utilizing all the tools that you have um to to kind of get the result that you want and also you know you're doing one a day so you're like i need to i want to do something more complicated or something i'm not comfortable with so how do i get there in a way that makes me you know that i can do quickly that i'm mm -hmm. comfortable with and it kind of bri bridges like all that gap which is cool so you can kind of see what this one ended up looking like mm -hmm. some of these i ended up having fun playing in maya so like they're a little bit more resolved than they need to be mm -hmm. so and then this i have the character off just so i because i didn't need the character um shadows are cool though that's kind of like its own spookiness to just having not having the character in there. Yeah, I know. I think that's interesting. Are you saying like sometimes you get caught though? You're like, I get caught in my, like I'm enjoying the process of doing what I'm doing and I'm like, oh yeah, I got to take a step back and, and go back to what I was working on or what the end goal is. I definitely find myself doing that in certain projects where I'm like, you know, I'm going to just do a little test here. Um, you know, I'm just going to enjoy this. And all of a sudden, you know, 15 hours later, several days later, I've spent, you know, a lot more time in the project in this quote unquote test of what I was going to be doing. Uh, I, I get lost down rabbit holes all the time. All right. Well, I, uh, I'll jump over to my stream because I wanted to give you a moment to start blocking out or figure out what you were going to be working on. I'm actually continuing a piece that I had started in Jared Krzyzewski's Art Jam stream earlier this year. So I, uh, similar to use some, of, some of what you're talking about using a, like a kit. So this is the piece that I worked with, uh, with Jared uh, a couple weeks ago. And we, he was, has been doing some really cool stuff with the thick skin feature inside of ZBrush. And so I uh, wanted to brought him on and we kind of showed me how he was doing it, which is a really fun piece. And so I, I have this larger scene here that I, I just, while Alex was chatting, I've been kind of adding this thick skin clay 
traditional sculpture vibe too. And I'll probably do this to the rest of these creatures and characters during the stream. Uh, but so he started with a similar thing. So each one of those characters that you see, uh, you know, posed around here, each one of these, and even these these characters here, start from this base human, uh, so cool. and he's and he's broken this up so that each one of these thing, each one of these parts of the body is a an individual element, an individual piece. So you can quickly grab them, you can mask them. You know, you can rotate them and you can pose them really quickly, which is cool. And then to get more expression, especially if you're doing different uh, things, he brought in, you know, different hands. So kind of creaturey hands with some claws, some, uh, you know, like let's isolate this. So some different hand shapes, different hand positions, a fist. And then above that, he has all these heads that he had sculpted. So if you wanted like a cyclops or you wanted like more of an, an evil grin or, you know, a scared, all these heads, uh, and then even just a blank one, which is what I ended up uh, using for my sort of villain. So I took all these and you know, using his, his setup and uh, took them and kind of have been messing around with them and I'm gonna start combining them into being uh, bigger elements here as well. So I'm going to turn this, I think I may have moved this character at some point. There he is, like a sort of a Cyclops eye blast. I'm going to blow some of these, just like how this one's having some like explosion, like have a yeah. hole being kicked through it. I'm going to do that with this character here. And I was thinking about this character having like a, some sort of like a Magneto style, like force field, like a Sue Storm force field of like a, trying to do a shape around it. Uh, to kind of get some effects in here. And then I'll sculpt. This is another guy that I sculpted another villain in one of our previous streams actually using the uh what's it called the the dynamics that zbrush added some dynamics features and you could do like cloth sculpting and mm -hmm. so instead of using it for cloth i used it for like this kind of wrinkly loose saggy skin and it worked out really really well uh yeah, so i'll probably gross. Oh, yeah, yeah, really gross. As I was sculpting, I was like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want this brush to do. That's um, awesome. So I'll probably put this as like some sort of a, you know, hero. Like I, I'm imagining the, the illustration, maybe doing a couple angles, but like this sort of, you know, good versus evil crew kind of thing happening. So it'll be a fun one to work on. Uh, but yeah, definitely a fun thing to kind of play with the kit. That's one of the things I like. As I, I'll just start sculpting on this. Um, as I've taken the existing, this is like one that I haven't done, so I'll jump over to this one later. Actually, this head is something I sculpted in another stream. So just kind of taking different elements of, of what we've worked on and kind of combining them into single things. But I ended up dynameshing this into one piece and then uh, open up this thick skin and you just click this button, it's really easy. You know, so it's all one Dynamesh object. So if I turn this off, right, I can move it around just like you could any other ZBrush thing. But if I turn on thick skin, it only allows you to move within that range of, of this slider. So it kind of does like this, uh, when you dial it in, it gives you like this choice of how big you want the volume to be. Mm -hmm. So you, you choose the volume and then it'll only move within that volume that you've set. And so they have this clay, uh, thing what you can basically brush and it's like a very traditional clay brush but it'll only go to the volume that you set and that's basically what that slider does but it makes it so easy to kind of get into this like clay it, it, it's actually kind of difficult though at the same time because you want to get away from like making everything look good like you mm -hmm. can just go over everything I think he had it at 20 which is the default Go over so what, the do, what do you think is the main application of thick skin? Of thick skin, I see it as being something that can be like a nice a way to add details because I think you could, without affecting the surface, like without affecting the volume. Because okay. sometimes you're, well, I mean, if you're doing this, it's like you know, kind of obvious. We want to make it like a clay feature, but I could see something being interesting of like trying to not affect the volume trying to not affect details. I don't know what else you could use it for though, but I hmm. think there's something there's something there with just being able to sculpt on the surface and it, it like really, like I'm doing a lot of 
motion to the surface, obviously, yeah. but it's yeah. not changing the volume. So I could see this being really interesting. And I wonder if like, even like I'm switching to the build up brush, but I'm sculpting like, like here. The build up brush doesn't can go basically past be it. used with any brush. Any brush, yeah. yeah. So like, I'm wondering like if I were to take a, almost like how you could do a morph target before, like you could do a morph target and store it, and then you could, um, like, it wouldn't inflate the the volume of the size. I think there's a way you could probably do that. That would be pretty interesting. So, I think right. just adding some really cool. Like, I don't know what this is. Hmm. But let's just like if I turn this off. Kind of the same, but I think there's an interesting thing there. I don't know what it, I don't. This fracture brush. That I just played with that. It's actually a really cool feature. Yeah, I'm gonna cool. get some like dynamics into this thing. Oh, it feels. It adds that sort of like very a traditional clay sculpture feeling. There's also like the rake brush. Mm -hmm. You know, rake is like a classic sculpting tool, so you could kind of come in and and rake or you know take a surface and. Make it feel like you're trying to build up or, or carve out clay, which is cool. I think you'll see, I mean, I think there's like an element also for the 3D printing world for like figures and stuff, that yeah. kind of clay style that you could kind of come in and do this. You can get that traditional look now. Yeah. If you wanted to in a digital space, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Need Pretty to get cool. A yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely a fun project. I, I was super excited when Jared jumped on to. to has, he, uh, has he tried printing out any of those scenes? These? We talked about it. He, the challenge is a lot of them are actually impossible because he's doing a lot of this kind of stuff, right? Where it's things that would be floating and uh, you can't really print that stuff because it's just floating in air. Like you would have to find a way to like join everything to like an element, I guess, that, that would be grounded and also weighted. So I don't know. I don't think he's done anything yet. We talked about it, but uh, I definitely want to try it. I want to get some some 3D prints of this stuff, and it'd be a fun thing to... It reminds me, like, when he did this, it reminded me of, I don't know if you, you've probably seen, but Simon Lee's clay like scenes that he does. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the That's big amazing. like zombie. They're so cool. I love that kind of stuff that yeah, he's been he's doing. Scary good. Is super good. I love his work. Yeah, so much he's gesture. So fast. Yeah, he's just always pumping out cool stuff. Mm -hmm. and that was kind of what I liked about doing this with Jared was it was kind of uh, one of those things where you can get to a final result relatively quickly. Like you don't mm -hmm. have to worry about the final because you're focusing. It's more gestural. Yeah. I don't know if it would work. You know, I was asking him if, if clients have asked for this type of work and he said not yet. So yeah. maybe there's a world where it becomes, you know, I want something faster and I want that kind of gestural look that's possible. Yeah. But, I but working, being able to work fast is like, you know, I think that's where, you know, drawing is something that's, like, and sketching and doodling is such like considered to be a 2D drawing with a pencil thing and like getting mm -hmm. into figuring out ways to doodle in 3D, I think is, uh, just makes 3D a lot more fun. Yeah, you know, that's that a big not part everything of it. has to be a final production asset for your portfolio. That sometimes, like, just try to have fun. Yeah, exactly. Just have fun. Just enjoy it. Just you know, uh, make something you like. I think is a, a big part of it. Uh, I see a question in the chat, which is was asking about where this kind of started from. I think it was about the meshes, mm -hmm. and so uh, this is from Jared Krzyzewski. Uh, who was on a previous art jam. It's also our, our I think he's our creature uh, modeling instructor right now. Mm -hmm. yep. And so, yeah, he and kind of gave us this, and an enrollment alum, yeah. Um, he gave us this kit of all these pieces, and so kind of combining all those, posing them together to create, there we go. Kind of he a gave scene us, of, or he gave you? He gave me. Sorry, <laughs> you can have it if you wanted it. He gave us art jam as the community. Uh, okay. Yeah, this piece, which is cool. We've been yeah. working on that. Cool. Told him he should uh, put it up some online somewhere, but he was—he's not sure. So we'll see. 
Yeah, I Hopefully. think I remember somebody asking about that and him, him saying, like, make your own. Maybe. Yeah, it's not hard to make your own. Yeah, I mean, Relatively it's the same thing with me and you know, people have asked, you know, if I would share my shelves and my assets. And I just kind of think it's it's so important to know how to make them, mm -hmm. you know, because that's in the end much more useful than, um, I mean, like kit bashing is cool, but I think for, especially for students, you know, like if you just go and go to Kitbash 3D and download their stuff and start making scenes, then it doesn't really, then you don't necessarily know how to model or UV or texture or anything. You're mm -hmm. just doing layout, which is a job being a layout artist, mm -hmm. but you have to consciously be like, I want to be a layout artist and use other people's assets. Right. But I think uh, it's the whole, like, what is it, uh, you know, teach a man to fish thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's just sometimes you see people's things like that and they just like so look, look like so much fun to play with. <laughs> That's exactly what it is. That's why I was like, I, I could make one for this, but I could also just play with this one and that'll be, that's equally fun for me right now. Yeah. Making a ground plane. To, uh, made this little you know, mud area here. So I'm going to do the same kind of thing, bring this down and uh, kind of just warp it around. Make it the same shape. Turn on Dynamesh for this piece. A little high, but not too bad. I'll use my snake hook brush to kind of just warp the shape around. I think it was a brush that I really slept on for a long time. And it was like the classic, like making horns brush mm -hmm. for so long. And now I really like it. I don't know if they changed it or if they did something to it, but it just feels way better than it used to be. This, and then I'm going to go in here, turn that thick skin on, give it some volume. And go to that brush that we were using and now we can kind of just push this around this is actually one thing i've seen it be useful for i guess it, when it's not just a texture but like putting this plane down and then going back to it and saying like okay i'm gonna kind of push this space around so i kind of set like a little and maybe there's like an environment workflow that's sculpting shapes or something that could be useful yeah do you have a uh, alpha library in zbrush that you've made i have a bigger one yeah that i that i kind of carry around with me uh, for i don't have them specifically for environment stuff but i have them for like skin textures scales alphas for that kind of stuff yeah cool yeah somebody just asked if i ever use zbrush for environment art always <laughs> For sure. <clears throat> so ZBrush is great for great environment tool. stuff. Yeah, I think it's it's like if you go to ZBrush Central, the bulk of the stuff you see there is character stuff. And so I think that mm -hmm. makes a lot of people think that it's like a character tool. Mm -hmm. But it's really just a sculpting tool. So I mean you can literally make anything. And with all of the new modeling tools they've been added at this point, it seems like almost anything is possible from hard surface to characters absolutely. to environments. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I generally block things out first in Maya if I'm doing an illustration based on a concept just because I need to make sure it's matching the camera. Mm -hmm. But then at that point, I'll take block outs and go to ZBrush, whether it's a rock or a mountain or the ground or a tree trunk. Mm -hmm. um, all my photogrammetry stuff goes through ZBrush because it's so much easier to clean up the scan in ZBrush and then, you know, Z remesh it because for photogrammetry stuff, the topology doesn't need to be riggable. So Z remesher is like perfect for remeshing scans. It's like exactly what you need. Um, Somebody's asking if you would create mountain. Uh, would you create mountain cars or any assets straight in ZBrush? I think some of those you could, like cars, maybe not. 
mountains you could but alex is showing some of the cool stuff from other like programs that you could use to make you know mountains and landscapes and stuff like that yeah uh, i got a question from youtube it says those characters are not a single mesh uh, i think you're kind of asking how they're how these characters are organized so these are all different uh sub tools up in the, the area over here you'll kind of see them here and so each one is kind of its own individual tool. Yep. Some of these are going to be bulked into a couple tools. So this one, for example, it has this body. And then above it, so I'm actually, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to merge this head with this body. I'm just going to select whatever's on top. I'm going to go down to our merge option, hit merge down and hit OK. It says I can't do that because something's hidden. So I'll show everything on whatever's being hidden. Looks like I had this head that is just floating over here. Uh, so we'll, we'll hide that or delete that. Delete hidden. There we go. Yes, it looks like a scrolled magneto. Thank you. That's what I said earlier. This is like a magneto pose. Uh, we'll, we'll merge this down. And now this is all one piece of geometry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to dynamesh this all together because each one of these pieces is actually an individual uh, mesh that's being kind of mashed together. Uh, so I'm going to take that. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to quickly go over each of them and make sure that there's no big gaps like this is kind of happening. So I'll go into our move topology brush. What that does is it works like a move brush, but I can do a big move, but it only works on individual meshes. So I can just kind of quickly go here and just push these things together. Uh, without having to select them, mask them, do anything like that. And I can kind of get these shapes to make sure it's working. That's cool. A little bit better. Yeah, for, the that, like uh, for the person that asked about uh, like environment stuff in ZBrush, I'm just going to show a couple cool things real quick. Let's see sure. if I can hop over to you. Uh, sure. Right. Um, so yeah, I've just like how I've got my shelves in Maya. Um, I've got a bunch of, uh, alphas that I've made in ZBrush. And so if I go in here, uh, basically when you install ZBrush, there's a folder called Z alphas in the install directory. And then in that directory, you can put your own folders. So it comes with a few um, uh, alphas, like these kind of skin looking ones, which are actually from the Aaron Sims alpha pack that he made for Nomen years ago. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, these folders that I added. So if I go into one of these, then what it's loading is alphas that I made in uh, World Machine. And then in the folder, it uh, has a render that I did in Maya because it's kind of abstract to look at alphas sometimes and know what effect you're going to get. And so just like I have a little render of each alpha, so I kind of know what, I'll, what I'm going to get if I drag it on. So if I grab this alpha, and again, this is just a height map exported from World Machine. And if I double click on it and it loads in as an alpha over here on the left, then if I drag, then I've got a little you know, sort of terrain alpha. So I'm just going to make that a little stronger. So, so you can see that for people wondering about, you know, using ZBrush mm -hmm. for, you know, environment stuff, like just with, you know, a good library of alphas, then there you go. I've now got a little train. Yeah. And like, and similar to like your other thing, you could start that, your composition in there too, I'm sure. Or oh, figuring yeah. that out. Um, and so it's, uh, pretty amazingly cool. So like the thing is, is that, you know, doing it this way, uh, opens up a little bit of complexity because I now don't have all those world machine masks. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's a different workflow that comes in to, to get those masks, but, uh, but yeah, here, I'm just going to undo and go back to life. It's going to load in. I can go and grab, you know, look around and be like, oh, maybe I want uh, that guy. 
double click, do the weird ZBrush thing where sometimes you have to double click twice. And, and then, you know, this one, let's raise the intensity up. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be a different looking kind of train. And you can see how, like, even using the same alpha over and over again, it's not necessarily obvious that that's what I'm doing. And now I've got a different terrain. And then I could start making more sub tools and adding rocks and boulders and sculpt on this. This is a million polys right now. These alphas are all 2K. And so I'd say like a good tip with ZBrush alphas is that the resolution of the alpha tells you how many polygons it can accurately displace. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a 2K alpha, meaning that one of these images is 2000 by 2000 pixels, 2000 times 2000 is 4 million. And so that means that that alpha could accurately displace 4 million polygons. So if I had a plane that was 4 million polygons, I could drag that alpha out to fill the entire plane and not see pixelation. And so you can see why like, there's not a lot of reason for an alpha to be bigger than 2K, mm -hmm. because yeah, 4 million sense. polygons is, is enough generally for an alpha to displace. And if they get too big, then they get slow and take up a lot of RAM. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're loading a bunch of them at once. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I just thought that might be a useful thing to show for people wondering about sculpting yeah. something that's like not a character. And then for like sculpting rocks, if I, let's say, uh, make something different. So like if I go out here and switch, uh, let's say I make a, let's make a sphere. And uh, I'll just divide it a couple of times, go to Lightbox. Instead of going to my World Machine folder, I've got another one in here called uh, Cliffs Edit. And these are alphas that I made from photogrammetry of rocks and cliffs that I did. And if I double click one of these in and raise the intensity up, then I can kind of see, you know, let's go actually and divide this one more time. So that's a little harsh on that one. That one's not a great alpha, to be honest. <laughs> but the point is, is that, uh, you know, I can drag this one on. I don't really like how that one looks, though. So let's grab a different one. So now I took the sphere and made this rocky thing out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> so because uh, something that anybody who's tried to sculpt a rock, it's like rocks are, you know, sculpting this from scratch with just like, you know, clay buildup would be hard to make yeah, it look that difficult. good. Yeah. And if this is just some rock that's like, you know, in the background in your scene somewhere and it's not, you know, necessarily all that, you know, important, then, you know, do you really want to spend... Um, a whole day sculpting that asset you don't necessarily need to so you can just go mm -hmm. in and just use alphas and kind of get a rocky element that i could put in the scene you know back over there and it kind of you know might be all i need if you're doing like a full scene what percentage of your workflow is like different programs is it like 80 percent maya 80 percent zbrush you use uh, the other ones in world uh, world machine and speed tree and stuff it'll it'll depend on if i if i need an asset that i don't already have in my library and i have to make it from scratch mm -hmm. then i may end up spending a whole bunch of time in speed tree let's say okay. um and so that's kind of uh so yeah if i if i already have all the assets i need to make something then i'm going to stay in maya mm -hmm. but uh but then if i'm like oh i need this you know a uh, cave entrance that looks like a, a creature mouth that's open. Um, I'm going to go to ZBrush to do that. But I'd block it out in Maya first to make sure it fits the position and the scale and the scene. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, so I, I think it kind of depends. So I, I find that, you know, if I have an illustration that I have to match, like if I want to start doing my Inktober stuff, it's pretty unlikely I'm going to have stuff in my library that matches everything that's in a doodle, that's in a drawing. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying with that 
little forest with the campfire, like I'd have to go to Speed Tree. And how long would yeah. I spend in there to get trees that look like that one? The nice thing with Speed Tree is it has a huge library, like mm -hmm. of presets. So it's really the time to find the preset that gives you a good starting point, tweak the preset to look the way you want and export it. So that could take, you know, if you're lucky, you could get it done in an hour. It could take, you know, a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, really? It's like, you know, if I've got a hillside that's supposed to be covered in ivy, like right. I can't just import something off my library shelf necessarily to do that. I might have to grow ivy on it. And then I have to export that geometry to speed tree, grow ivy on it. That might take, you know, some time. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's different for every image, like how much I'm in Maya versus ZBrush versus other programs. What about you? I do, depending on the project, I, I'll use kind of that as well, but I'd still say most of my stuff is going to be in ZBrush, Photoshop, and then Maya, probably in that order, unless I'm doing polymodeling, you know, like, uh, you know, like a lot of the Marvel work I was doing or uh, doing a hard surface suit of some kind. I'm getting into using ZBrush more for hard surface, but in the past, I, I would say it was kind of... 99% Maya for all of my pieces that I did, just kind of straight up box modeling and poly modeling things together. And so that would be, you know, depending on the project, if it's a creature, 80, 90% ZBrush. If it's a character character, like clothing, face, costume, uh, again, 80, 90% ZBrush. But if it's hard surface for me, it's been 80, 90% Maya. Okay. And Photoshop is kind of my number one finishing and presentation tool. So I'll always spend a good amount of time wrapping that up in there. Especially if it's an illustration, like a concept illustration, uh, I like to spend a good amount of time painting over at the end to try to get rid of some of the 3D elements to it. Because most of my renders like in ZBrush or Keyshot or something like that are, they need a little bit of touch up from like the presentation angle. ZBrush and Keyshot are good renders but they're not great for you know final lighting in a lot of the times so yeah. trying to get that last little bit in in photoshop and painting over to add that stuff or adding design elements and just kind of finalizing is the way that i kind of go with that yeah i never got into the zbrush rendering thing i always felt it looked a little funny it looks a little weird but i think that that's for me where i like it when I want to do illustration, like if I want it to feel more like an actual illustration and painting, that forces me to remove myself from what the 3D looks like. Like it almost is like I, I drop it and I, I now just look at it as a uh, tool to just paint with. Like this is my starting image I'm going to paint on top of rather than saying like, okay, I have this 3D. How do I keep the 3D there? So it kind of is is intentionally, I use it intentionally to to break away from what the 3D object was looking like or what the, the render was looking like. And that for me can speed it up a little bit too. Uh, it looks like we have a question from uh, Twitch which is asking, do you ever use Nuke for post editing on your renders? Or what do you use for post editing on your renders? I use Photoshop. You use Photoshop? Yeah, what about you? Oh, definitely Photoshop. I don't do as enough uh, moving image stuff to use Nuke, I think, for to really utilize Nuke. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, Nuke is amazing. I have used Nuke, and there's a lot of things about it, especially with 32-bit, you know, EXR mm -hmm. workflows that are, it, it's just designed for that much better than Photoshop. Mm -hmm. But I still just like doing stuff in Photoshop. I think it's a comfortable program for me. I kind of can get lost in it too. So just kind of enjoy noodling and playing around with it. Yeah. But that's but I think that's because maybe both of us are doing a lot of stills. Sure. Um, but yeah, if I was working on anything animated, then obviously it would be nuke. And so um so I think it's it's a good habit if you're trying to go into production. Yeah. Um I definitely recommend learning nuke and being able to just do all of your comping and you know, grading and all of that stuff using a 32-bit 
you know, workflow because it, it's just going to give you a lot more control, especially mm -hmm. if you want things to look photo real. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, yeah. that's one thing that, you know, you're only going to get things so far with V-Ray or Redshift or any renderer. Like you might get 80% of the way to photo real, but the last 20%, which is like super important, is pretty much always going to be in post. Yeah. And so that's where it's like, you know, like you look at the stuff that Miguel and Tran do. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, you see where it, what it looks like when it came out of Maya and when it looks like after Miguel finished comping it in Nuke. And it's like, it's amazing. It's a very different thing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it goes like from looking like a 3D render to looking like a photograph. Yeah, I think that's some, that's an interesting like kind of maybe misconception in the three D community that your final render always has to be like the final image. You know, yeah. there's a, so there's so much comp and post work to make sure that you know that's really go to the next level in every you know in every production that's happening. People are asking, uh, so and I think you may have just covered this, but uh, if you're building an environment in ZBrush, how do you, what's the way that you would texture that? Um, I would texture it in Maya Good. predominantly, you know, just using shaders and masks. Um, hmm. And so for like something like this, if I needed to texture it, um, creating the masks is a pretty important step. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would potentially take the displacement map of from this because this is just a plane so i can take mm -hmm. the displacement map that zbrush would create over to world machine and then use that in world machine to create a terrain where then uh world machine will create all of the masks with this as a start point mm -hmm. and then that would allow me to texture this thing a lot easier because using a lot of masks to control you know what's rocky what's grass what's snow you know masking is kind of a big part of that so i would spend a lot of time making masks right we got a question in the chat which we've talked about you and i have chatted about a bunch uh but it's about blender is mm -hmm. it a good com competitor to maya is it a, and there's kind of a tangent question in here which is is it reliable to produce high quality renders for professionals to use I think there's kind of two parts in there. First, I think let's like kind of cover general Blender in the industry. It's obviously being used a lot in the, you know, that I would say like the modeling and uh, concept art community. Mm -hmm. But as far as industry use or or you know studio use, it's not really being used that way, right? Because of it, it doesn't. I don't know. I, our, I think we've placement, talked about this. Our place. placement department doesn't get requests uh, from recruiters for Blender artists. Right. <clears throat> so that's how, you know, Noman looks at things is, you know, since Noman exists to help people start careers. Um, and so it's all about learning what the studio that you want to work for uses. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the way to look at it. And <clears throat> our, I'm going to drink some coffee. One second. <laughs> Yeah, so if the industry isn't getting it <clears throat> or asking for it. Yeah. So like our placement department <clears throat> is always talking to recruiters. And so if, if the bulk of them lately are asking for Maya, Houdini, and Unreal, like those are the three uh, mm -hmm. sort of hub softwares that are the most popular uh, in production. Uh, most studios pipelines are built around Maya, especially if you're talking about visual effects and games. And so from that perspective, um, if you want to work at Blizzard or you want to work at Blur or you want to work at ILM or Weta or Disney or DreamWorks or The Mill or MPC or you know, all these places, then uh, you kind of want to focus on what they use. And so that's where you're going to find Maya, Houdini, Unreal as being safer bets. But Blender is awesome. You just mm -hmm. have to realize that you know, Blender has changed a lot in the last couple of years. So like Blender five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when studios were setting up their pipelines was not awesome. Mm -hmm. And so today, you know, studios don't just on a whim change their pipeline. Um, and so I think that, you know, Blender is a great program for people to get started with who are new to 3D, who are still trying to see if they're interested in learning about it and um, if it's for them. 
it's free. So I think anybody who's, you know, looking to try it out, I would suggest Blender. But once yeah. you get to a school like Noman, we're going to teach you Maya, Houdini, Unreal, and all these surrounding tools just because that's what the studios need you to know. That doesn't mean that in five years, our curriculum could slowly evolve and maybe Blender will become a bigger part of it. It's just we very much are focused on, on studio feedback. But I do think, like you said, like a lot of concept artists are using it because, you know, they're focused more on making stills. Mm -hmm. But, you know, imagine some huge epic, you know, scene from the Avengers that has tons of characters and effects and simulations and demolition and like these massive scenes. You know, those are where, you know, a Maya Houdini pipeline is going to be the workflow. Right. But, you know, if you just want to, you know, do stills uh, and get into concept art, then I don't think people would care if you were using Blender. Right. Then it's whatever's easier for you to use, whatever, you know, the individual, like, sort of solo artist, operator, person, right? Even small teams, right, could be using that. And I think I've seen some people making cool stuff in Blender. If, even if it is animated stuff, it is, you know, they do cool things, but it's not necessarily on the scope that of what a big Maya scene or big production is going to handle. So right. It's definitely something that we recommend to you know if you want to you want to be playing around with 3d and see if you like it there's i don't think there's a better place to start you know it, it's a free program it's got a lot of cool stuff going on it's got a huge community so mm -hmm. use that but if you want to step into production and that's what you you know you think you want to do this as a career you know learning my is Speaking of softwares, I got a question, which is what uh, what is the main thing you'd like to learn, but you haven't gotten around to yet? Unreal. Unreal. Yeah, Unreal is cool. I, I haven't spent a bunch of time in it either. There's just so much cool stuff, and I'm excited for Unreal 5 mm -hmm. to see what they do with that. And I'm very curious about you know the, the poly count doesn't matter stuff. Very yes, curious to I see how that plays out. I'm super curious about that because that would be, I mean, the idea, if it's true, that you could just take your 20 million poly from ZBrush and get it right into Engine without having to do any LODs yeah. or opt it's just like, that would be nuts. Yeah, it'd be cool. It'd be really so much cool. Time. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, seeing things really like that, you know, medieval village in Quixel was just like, oh my God, it's like the. You know, that's the whole like Blender versus Maya versus Unreal. Like every tool is unique and every program has things they can do the other one can't. So like, you know, and, and so it's not so much about this tool is better than that. It's more like this tool is better at this thing and this tool is better at that thing. But you see something on like Unreal and you see how pretty the viewport is and all these cool layout tools it has for scattering geometry. And immediately you start to get jealous and be like, I wish Maya had that tool. I wish Maya had that tool. I wish <laughs> yeah. Maya's yes. viewport looked that pretty. Yep. But, uh, but yeah, no, Unreal is uh, really impressive. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely the one that's right up there on my list. I think Houdini's always been interesting, but it feels like a much more daunting program for me. But the idea of uh, procedural stuff sounds cool. For sure. I mean, we we recently we've been releasing a few Houdini titles over at the Noman Workshop, and mm -hmm. we did released a Houdini Terrain title uh, a few weeks ago, and. Uh, pretty neat because a lot of the procedural stuff that you get like erosion and things like mm -hmm. world machine are in houdini mm -hmm. so uh but it's so like even though it's cool it's like am i going to learn houdini because of that it's like well i know maya i know world machine i think i'd probably rather learn gaia mm -hmm. which is another sort of newish terrain tool but if i was going to be an effects artist i'd learn houdini right like sims and fluids and demolition and you know for sure it's uh yeah because their market share has gone up quite a bit because they they fixed their pricing mm -hmm. houdini used to be you know i don't know if a lot of people in here would remember who are watching but it's like you know back in the 90s these programs were like ninety thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> right uh, when maya came out in 98 it was 50 grand you know and right. uh houdini same thing and then maya and everybody started lowering their prices 
down to like, you know, 25 grand, 20 grand, 15 grand. You know, I remember when Maya was $7,500, it was just like, oh my God, it's so cheap. <laughs> Even though that's still a lot of money. And, yeah. uh, and, but Houdini, like they kept their price at 20 grand. Like they were the last holdout of like wanting to stay at that really high price point. And that kind of mm -hmm. hurt them from a market share perspective because it was super powerful, but really expensive. Yeah, not and, affordable uh, for most studios or to get into it to like a, a different program to yeah. roll into your pipeline. Yeah. And, and, you know, accessibility to workforce. Cause a lot of studios think about that as well. You know, it's like, uh, if you can't find artists, then, you know, so like there's a lot more Maya people out there, um, than there are Houdini people just because of legacy of issues with price point availability of education pricing. But a lot of that has changed now. So Houdini is a lot more accessible. So yeah, they're they're cool, but I I would say you know definitely suggest if anybody's new, like don't try to learn everything. Pick one. Mm -hmm. I want to get into effects. I want to do sims and demolition and all that stuff. Then it's like Houdini. I want to you know yeah you know be a concept artist. Yeah, maybe Blender. Mm -hmm. You know, um, want to be I like making stuff. Like that's a ZBrush. Maybe Blender. Maybe Maya. Whatever you want to start with. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to be a, I mean, I would say for if you want to be a if modeling is part of what you want to do, then ZBrush for sure, regardless of what you want to model, characters, creatures, environments, props. Props less so, you know, you could probably yeah. just find just in Maya or a lot of other tools. Yeah, I'm just like, like on the asset creation plane. side. I'm blanking yeah. out this plane over and over again. I, I don't know if it's interesting. <laughs> Maybe I should. Yeah, I mean, Maya. Are, are we looking at my screen or yours? We're looking at yours. Yeah, you, I mean, I think you've got a cool landscape. So, yeah, just playing with alphas. It's like it's feels like you, you know, could uh, set something on that little like flat area right in the center, like kind of where you're orbiting around. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And so you're just kind of playing with a bunch of different alphas. Yeah, I just keep importing different alphas and then just sort of dragging them on and, you know, just sort of seeing what I get. But I don't have this at a very high resolution. I'm only at a million poly. So like this isn't some, if I wanted to make a train in ZBrush, I was going to send to Maya, I would have divided this way higher because it's a little low right. res. Um, because then like, because for what I'm doing, obviously, if I wanted the camera to be down here, then we have a problem mm -hmm. because it's going to be pretty low res in this mm, yeah. uh, area. And that's why I tend to try and start with a doodle yeah. so i kind of know what's the foreground what's the midground what's the background and i can separate those out into different sub tools mm -hmm. you know because there's enough resolution in this thing if it was going to be like you know a mountain range in the background and then the whole foreground gets replaced with something new right yeah that makes sense um but uh because otherwise if you wanted to have it be just one plane I would need to get into HD geometry and UDIMS. Yeah, and that sounds like a whole different ball game of like what you're actually doing at that point. Yeah, it's totally doable. It just means that you may need, you know, this to have the equivalent of a 32K map, which means it might end up being four, you know, or eight, eight K maps. And you know, you can do all that stuff in ZBrush, but it's a much slower process because you have to get into HD geometry, multi-map export definitely not a fun thing to do on a stream um, <laughs> yeah, because that's less that, entertaining because it's not as interactive it's a slower process but like uh but it's totally doable i mean i remember you know uh, a few years back uh eric hansen downloaded like all of the satellite dem data for the grand canyon and it was you know like 100k by 100k of data and right. was able to do a whole flyover over the grand canyon um, super high mm -hmm. res, but it required obviously, you know, multiple UV regions, which is a bit of a setup for shaders and all that stuff. Yeah, very different. <laughs> very so different yeah, for sure. Uh, if you were going to use something like that, how would you would you use it as a background? I guess then, like, uh, and then would you plop in elements to detail, to like for details in the background or the foreground, or how would you? If you're going to like, I guess I, my question is if you're using this and you know it's lower resolution, mm -hmm. uh, how would you use it in a scene? 
Um, well, for this, it's like, you know, again, it's only a million polys. So if I divide it again, it's 4 million. And you can see that the stuff that's back here is kind of okay for something that is back there. Mm -hmm. So the stuff that's in the uh, foreground, I would try and find areas where I could just get another piece of geometry in here, you know, uh, where you don't necessarily notice that it's, you know, the split. Because technically a real landscape is a whole bunch of different models. Every rock, every boulder, sure. everything is a yeah. separate distinct thing. So generally, if you build things in Maya, the way they kind of would exist in the real world, you won't have that issue of not having enough resolution on something because things on the foreground are distinct models. You know, so I think mm -hmm. uh, that's where I would probably want to break this out. So like this whole plane could be what's the, you know, BG stuff and make something else. But I, I'd do that whole block out in Maya, to be honest. Yeah, just kind of get you know. started that way. Yeah, so like, well, we got the uh, portal. Here, I'll jump over here. I'm okay. just kind of meshing all of these characters kind of in the background. So I'm working on all of these, uh, this one and this one and this one and this one. I'm kind of just dyna meshing them all. So they were this one here, um, you know, this, like they were all of these different pieces mm -hmm. and different meshes. And then now I'm just kind of getting them all prepped. So I'm just kind of doing some prep work to where now this is like a single uh, mesh. Right, so now it's it can be moved around, filling in some of these gaps, and then eventually I can kind of zone out and zen out and just be able to start doing this clay work, which I, I like quite a bit, but I don't like having, as I'm working myself through this pipeline, I don't like having to bounce back and forth from what I, I'm calling like the fun part and the prep work. So like I don't like having to, to dynamesh them all, make sure they all look good, make sure the little gaps are filled, and then go into the fun part and then rinse and repeat. So I'm kind of doing uh, this all at one time. So I'm prepping, 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 and I'm about to prep this piece here. So these are all right now different pieces. And I just kind of merged them over. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just kind of take this clay brush, not the thick skin brush, but the clay brush and fill this gap so that it doesn't uh, look so action figure-y, I guess, from the kit that Jared uh, created. And just fill all those little gaps and then I, once i got that done i'll move on to the next character i'm just doing this like basically for the whole scene it's and cool. uh, all they fun together. yeah like just using the clay brush you can kind of fill this up it doesn't take very long it takes you know five ten seconds really to do like a character there's parts of it where it's like okay and i'll just kind of sculpt this i'm not really going to see that you just kind of use the clay and, and fill that in and it doesn't take too long I'm doing the little prep work and getting my getting my scene ready. Got about an hour and fifteen less left in the stream, so I'm hoping to get to the point where I can kind of just be you know, zinning out on the last couple characters here and and getting trying to work on uh, getting this piece finished. I was when I was making it, I was chatting with Jared. I was like, I I think I bit off to more than I could chew like with the first one <laughs> like like i just doing this was enough work for for a whole three hour session and so now getting all of these other characters in the scene is quite a bit of uh quite a bit of additional work that i was not really planning for but it's fun to do and i, I want to do like a final uh render to kind of capture it because i really enjoy working in this workflow so it's it's a fun one I'm do this one next too because I think I combined all those elements. I'm gonna come in here. I think uh, my resolution to like on this on my scene it's like 280. I just hit Dynamesh. Did soften that face up a little bit, which is maybe okay. So maybe I'll go like 400. Yeah, still not sure. 500. I don't want to go crazy high. I don't want to go over like I'm two million. Probably enough. I actually want it to be somewhat lower because then the um, actual like meshing of the two uh, objects here, like these meshes, gets a little more apparent. So that's why I'm in the ground, and then I can just clay that up. That's kind of work. I, I'm enjoying this process of through it's like, like steps it's like step phase one phase two and this is like 
phase two after doing the pose and then the block out and figuring out what the characters are going to be doing, what the, their powers are. And now it's just kind of getting it into the, the next zone. I probably should have put costumes on them. I, I realized that was something Jared did during his stream that I hadn't really thought about. So that's why I had thrown that, that uh, cape on there. And very inspired by the boys, by the way. I think you, you watch the boys, right? I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it's cool. The boys? Oh, I think you would really like it. It's very well, we just finished inspired. Cobra Kai, so now I can watch something new. Oh, there I you go. I, I haven't watched that, yet. Watched that I haven't no, watched I, it yet. I have mixed, mixed feelings about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm, good. I've it's, heard. But it's so things. cheesy. It is, it is so cheesy. Yeah? Which, you know, makes you laugh. But sure. I'm... I'm ready to watch something else. I heard The Expanse is really good. Oh, yeah. If you haven't seen The Expanse, I think you would really like The Expanse. Uh, Expanse is great. I think you would really like The Boys. Um, what else? I know, you, I know you watched Witcher. We've talked through that one. I've watched Witcher uh, three times. You went for a third time on it. I've only done two. Yeah. I like it, though. Yeah. I definitely am a fan of that, for sure. I I, people watching may not know, but I feel like you are uh, you hundred percented Witcher three, or you were yeah, close. like like one hundred and thirty hours or something. That yeah, so that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I not when I came out, like I think I you know maybe I think I finished it like a couple of years ago, which I just knew it was going to be a rabbit hole, and I knew it was going to be cool, and I knew if I started, I was going to want to finish it, and that's what happened. Mm -hmm. It's like I started playing Witcher, and then it's like. A month later, I'm like, yep, that's what I did last month. <laughs> I played Witcher all month, yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't played Cyberpunk, though. I played it a little bit. Uh, I just kind of got into it, and then kind of you know, other things got in the way, but I haven't, I haven't jumped back into it. But I talked to a bunch of friends, and they really, really have liked it when they, when they got into it. It's done. I mean, it for sure looks okay. awesome. But the thing, I'm weird. Like, I, I, when it comes to movies, I love sci-fi. But when it comes to games, mm -hmm. I love fantasy. Hmm. Okay. But uh, what is one of your favorite? I mean, let's favorite movies. What's what are some of your favorite movies? Uh, geez. Well, Blade Runner, obviously. I had a feeling I've seen the, the most Blade times. Runner. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And then uh, I know a lot of people don't like this movie, but Dune, like the David Lynch Dune, is one of. My Are you excited movies. for the new Dune? Are yes. You skeptical. I'm not skeptical. I'm sure it's going to be cool. The trailer was rad. The fact that they put yeah. Floyd in the trailer was just like, you know, while Floyd is obviously a very loved band, you just don't see their music used a lot, mm -hmm. and. Uh, no, I mean, his movies so far, the directors have been really good. So I look forward to it. But I don't know. I'm in the minority on, on David Lynch's Dune. I really love the vibe of that movie. It's definitely got a very specific atmosphere and like vibe to it that I don't think many other films have. Exactly. Um, Inception is one of my top movies. Ooh, I love Inception. I really like Inception. I like I, I, I we've talked about this, but I like uh, Interstellar more than I like Inception now. Really? Uh, because every time, yeah, I don't know why it is. I, every time I watched like, and it's like the reverse effect for me in some way. Like the first time I saw Interstellar in theaters, I really, really disliked it. I did not like it for some reason. And then as I've watched it more and more, every time I watch that movie, I like it more than I watched it the time before. Inception, I still really like. It's not that it's a bad movie, but I'm, I've only seen Interstellar once, so maybe I need it. to rewatch it. You should watch it again, then maybe you'll have the same feeling. I really like it. I think it's great. And then uh, anything Terry Gilliam. Mm -hmm. So huge fan of Terry Gilliam movies. And uh, I got. Somebody in the chat is asking uh, where these will be. Will these be available later on our YouTube channel? Yes, they will. So go ahead and uh, pop over to the YouTube channel and Art Jam. This one and all the other ones will be there. Uh, this is not pre-recorded. Uh, Hannibal EX from Twitch. Uh, 
this model is not available. This is uh, from one of our previous streams uh, with Jared Krzyzewski. He kind of showed his process where he would be creating a basic model like this and several heads and hands to be uh, available for choosing and then posing them all around and then kind of combining them into one big scene is kind of what I'm doing here. So yeah, somebody says they completely agree with me about Interstellar. They like it the more after, uh, really like it more so after a few viewings. Somebody says, good idea to watch Dune again. You got another fan of Dune. Cool. No, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I watched it with my kids and they, they looked at me at the end and were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, man, like, what? Bummer. Uh, uh, Evil Dead but, 2, by the way. Oh, yeah. Favorite movies. Evil one. Dead 2 it's is a really good one. Hilarious. I need to watch Part that. Of, uh, Terry well. Gilliam. Time Bandits. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see. And you said games. You like fantasy games, though. And so, which are you talked about? Uh, mm -hmm. What a, What are some of your other favorite uh, you know, video games that you've really played that you've enjoyed? Fantasy Dragon Age Origins was amazing. Ooh, that was such a good one. That was a really, yeah. really good one. Um, and then in the last couple of years, uh, I mean, Last of Us and Last of Us Two. That's not really fantasy. I mean. More no, but it's 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 a good one, yeah. But dude, Last of Us Two, holy crap! Yeah. Holy yeah, that crap! Game. That game, it's intense. I haven't finished it yet. I still haven't finished it yet. We, I know you, you told me like you got to finish it, got to get into it, but I got to get in there and finish that one. Um, Ghost of Tsushima, I really liked a lot. Mm hmm. I like this, the visuals of that. I haven't played it, but that seems awesome. You finished that one? Yeah. Yeah, no, I really, really liked it a lot. What was you, some of your the older games you like? I know you were a big uh, Myst fan, from, like one of your first big games. Uh, Myst, I mean, more as what it represented. Okay. Because, you know, it's so low res and um i don't know if it holds up very well but i think just the fact that you know at the time it was very influential it's what got me into 3d in a big way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh but riven was much more impactful for me uh, okay uh the sequel yeah because it looked amazing you know they switched from making it on a mac to you know buying sgis and making it i think they made it with soft image and mm. just the story the environments uh yeah, that that Riven definitely got me super excited about getting into like high end CG. Like mm -hmm. the difference from how Mist looked and how Riven looked. So I loved Riven. Um, but uh, 90s, I didn't play as many games because I was just so busy with art school and starting my career and all that kind of stuff that I felt that I didn't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. so you played I, some some like that too. Because I think you've you've said you play like WoW and like Ultima. And uh, yeah, in like the that. '80s, yeah, for sure. All you know, Ultima, The Wizardry, Bard's Tale, uh, mm -hmm. all of those like original RPG games. I was super into. And then, uh, yeah, in the last ten years, I've played way too much WoW. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, way too much. So I haven't I haven't played uh, in a while, and I've, I've I've managed to not play the last expansion. You and, fell off. Uh, yeah, I mean Griffin, my son, he definitely uh, has tried to get me back into it. It's yeah, again, it's one of those things that's dangerous. I I, I don't want to get back into. Wow, <laughs> to be honest, I've <laughs> played enough of it. It's awesome. Like I want to, I want to avoid it. Yeah, that's yeah. Funny. But uh, but Griffin's hardcore. I mean, you know, guilds raiding. I mean, it's like back in the day. You know, we could you know duel and. I could beat him sometimes and now forget it. Yeah, it's not worth it. <laughs> he's, he's got all the macros and hotkeys, and it's like his hand is just dancing over that keyboard. I'm like, wow. You're like, uh, yeah. Funny. Totally. Uh, let's see what 
kind of questions we got. Oh, I see in the, the Twitch chat, Original Sin 2, Divinity Original Sin 2, uh, one of my favorite games. I love that game. Uh, I also really love, and I've talked about it before on previous streams, but the Baldur's Gate 3 uh, beta or early access I'm in, I'm really enjoying that. I had to stop playing it because I didn't want to ruin the rest of the game for me when it eventually comes out. But yes, that is amazing. Um, a lot of people talking about The Last of Us being turned into a film. Mm -hmm, which it is with, with Neil Druckmann. So he's uh, at yeah. the helm of it. I think that's <laughs> but great. I, I, think it's, I don't know. Is it a film or is it a series? Oh, is it a film or a series? I saw somebody said film. We'll have to see what the chat says. But uh, the good casting there. I like the, the two leads that they've gotten with Pedro. And uh, it's a series, they said. Um, Pedro, and I can't remember her name, but the lady Mormont from Game of Thrones, the little the girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, saw, I saw the was, headline for that. And she's also, I don't know if you've seen the animated show Hildy or Hilda. Mm -mm. She's the main lead on that. It's a really great show, but she's the, the voice of that. Cool. Yeah, really great cast. Bella Ramsey. What, Bella Ramsey? But uh, somebody's saying a new game that's coming out is Valheim, which is supposed to be really good. It's like, I think it's a survival game from what I remember. And then uh, somebody has a question for us. What is the most impressive 3D VFX you've seen in a movie or TV show recently? That's a good one. Uh, most impressive? In the uh, VFX. Uh, Tenet had some cool stuff in it, which I and it had some very, great stuff very yeah. recently. Yeah. Oh, I just—I mean, I know it's uh, not a new movie, but uh, Life of Pi we just watched. Oh yeah. Which I know I'm very late to the party on that one, but uh, <laughs> when it came out, I wanted to see it, and then like it just—it got so many awards and so much praise that I just wanted to really have the right time to watch it. And anyway, like anyway, finally watched it like a month ago. Holy crap! Mm -hmm. right. I mean, it's great. So just the visual effects are so beautiful and so amazing and so complex and so unique that, uh, yeah, if anybody's a fan of effects who hasn't seen Life of Pi, dude. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. That's a really, really yeah. good one. And you one. worked on it. I did. I made some fish and turtles for that for some of the practical effects. Yeah, that was a fun one. Is that like Back the fish that falls on the boat? Yeah, the flying fish. I made some yeah. of those flying fish. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a great that's a really good film. Oh my god! It's um, I've really been enjoying. I don't know if it's the most impressive thing, but I just really have been enjoying Wandavision. I don't know if you've been watching that, but I yeah. really like that. Yeah, we just watched all of those. Uh, like we're caught yeah. up. Um, yeah, I didn't. The first couple episodes, I was like, "What is going on?" Yeah, but it's but, it's really cool. Especially in the most recent episode, there's some cool stuff there that I really liked from the visual effects side. I'm not, no spoilers, not going to try to get too specific on anything in case anybody's not watched it yet, but I think you should watch it because it's cool. But uh, yeah, I, I liked that quite a bit. Uh, I'm excited to see Godzilla vs. Kong. That's one that I want to watch when it comes out on HBO soon ish. Um, so I don't know. I'm trying to think of other best visual effects things that I've seen. Uh, Mandalorian. Oh yeah, pretty, sure. pretty impressive for a quote TV show. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, they had a lot of eggs in that basket, being like, you know, it's kind of like the show to launch Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if the shows that are coming in the future will have the same investment, but probably because Disney Plus sounds like it's been really, really successful. Mm -hmm. But the quality of the work in the Mandalorian, is yeah, pretty. It's really awesome. high. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a couple questions uh, we can address real quick. One is that they've seen the character design of God of War, and Kratos had muscles that expanded and contracted. The question is: Is it just God of War, or does every AAA title have a feature like this? For example, Last of Us Two. Um, not all of them. What you're seeing there is kind of blend shapes between the, you know, when the muscles are moving and contracting and that's sculpted. What you'll notice is it's often characters, games with a character that has a central hero, meaning like Kratos is the hero that, that you're playing as 90% of the time. 
And so they can add those features to him. Whereas if you're playing a game, maybe like Red Dead, where you can be a bunch of different characters or costumes or things like that, uh, they typically don't do that in those scenarios because there's too many permutations and calculations that could be there. Uh, but some games like Last of Us likely has that. And sometimes it's a uh, you'll see it in two ways. You'll either see it as a mesh that's being blend shaped or you'll see it as a blending of normal maps from one normal map to another normal map to simulate the what you're seeing. Instead of it being a mesh changing, it'll be a texture changing. So there's different ways there. One question about Nomen is, do we have a virtual production program in the works? This a question from Facebook. We don't have a program, but we do in our recent uh, unveiled uh, VFX concentration for our BFA, we do have a virtual production class. I think is, I don't know if it's running for the first time this term or next term, but it's coming out soon. Mm -hmm. cool. I'm going to bounce over to your stream. It looks like you've got a character set up. In uh, space. Yeah, because people were asking about, uh, you know, like how I would do something in ZBrush. So I just thought I'd just make this to illustrate that, where it's like mm -hmm. foreground, midground, background. Gotcha. And so basically, you know, by blocking it out in Maya, I can try and control where polygons are going mm -hmm. so that the geometry that's in the background isn't the same geometry that's near the camera. So like I could put an 8K texture on this, probably get away with this having a 4K texture or a 2K okay. texture. So it's really just, you know, doing things in like a foreground, midground, background. And then before mm -hmm. going to ZBrush with something like this, what I like to do is I'll select something and go into face mode. And then if this is my composition and it's locked, like I know that this is a composition I'm sticking with, I'll select my camera and set a keyframe on it. So even if I you know, screw my camera up, if I go back to frame one, I'm there. And then for this, if I know, well, that's where it is in frame, if I go to face mode, and I just select what's in frame, and then I switch to another camera, I can see if I have wasted polygons or not. Hmm. So I can see that basically I could export this to ZBrush, and that'd be fine because I'd be using most of the polygons that are on that mesh. Right. Um, but the thing is, is that, you know, if so if I do it with another one, so if I go into the foreground and select these and then go you can see there's some wasted polygons, right? Polygons that are out of frame. And so I could potentially, you know, inverse that selection and delete those polygons so that when I go to ZBrush, I just have more resolution for playing with mm -hmm. and dividing. But it's not really that many wasted because I scaled these kind of consciously. But if I made another, let's say I take these meshes and I go and let me just hide them for a second. Uh, if I go and make a new, uh plane and uh let me make a plane that has more polygons i'm just going to use a shelf button which just creates a denser plane so mm -hmm. if i were to make a plane that was kind of like this so like pretty right. big and then i'm like all right well that's my plane and i'm going to start sculpting on it so i'm going to go to let's say the sculpt tool and start you know blocking out and also you can see it like on my other monitor i've got you know this is there mm -hmm. so i can just start blocking out what this is going to look like and then once i've got this kind of starting to block out for like a simple thing for this image the thing is is that if i go into my shot cam on this guy and select faces to see kind of like mm -hmm. what's really in frame there's a lot of wasted polygons, you know? So like if I sent this to ZBrush to start sculpting, I wouldn't really be using any of this, but every time I divide, this is all being included, you know? So that's where like, I'd prefer to just have what's in this area, you know, be what's necessary. So by looking at this, I might then go to the top view and be like, all right, really what I need is maybe like this region of polygons. A little more, yeah. You know, so that now I can go and just invert that selection and delete. And that's now what I've got, you know, 
And so if I now sort of select these faces and go out here, it's like there's still wasted polygons, but not nearly as many. Right. And so uh, so for my sort of my uh, ZBrush back and forth, um, it just it, this saves me time because otherwise I'd end up having to deal with optimizing things later. Mm -hmm. And every you know every piece of texture space and polygons is kind of precious, so that's uh, that's kind of that. That makes sense. Uh, quite, people are asking what basically what your system specs are. Are you using a thread ripper? That's one. I'm on a no. I've got uh, it's a Lenovo workstation with uh, Intel Prox, uh, Xeon, and dual 20, 2080 Ti's. I think so. Um, which compared to some people is a lot, and some people isn't. But the thing that I like to remind people, it's like they made Jurassic Park on a computer that had on computers that had 128 <laughs> megs of RAM and 33 megahertz processors. Right. Yeah. So don't get hung up on your computer. Yeah, not, you don't let it be like a barrier. Of like you can't do something because of X. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, these days the GPU makes a huge difference, and you know, GPUs have become a lot more affordable. So I definitely highly recommend if you're going to get into, you know, 3D, it's good to have a good graphics card. I'd say that's more important than you know the CPU, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to use World Machine, World Machine isn't really GPU optimized; it's more CPU optimized. So it's uh, since I use a lot of different programs some which are gpu optimized and some which are cpu optimized that's why i have um good gpus and good cpus i think i was talking to paul and he said that um for paul from zbrush that zbrush doesn't use the video card ever except for one it's crazy uh, application i was like oh that's crazy it's like you don't need it in any way yeah yeah, it just really depends. Like your setup can really be customized, or you, know, you can uh, leverage that price point depending on what you what you use the most. Mm -hmm. I am very close to finishing my last prep on this person, and then I can begin claying everything up. I'll probably just jump into straight into this one though afterwards because I want to try that. But I'm super close with this one. Just going over here. Last piece, dynameshing it. There we go. I'm just doing this little clay. Just kind of getting it all set up. There's always parts of like the process that are fine that are um, not less fun, but they're just kind of more tedious. And I try to make them, you know, I try to zone out, I think is what I try to do, which is kind of like, you know, I try to do it and think about other things or talk or, you know, sometimes I feel like we've talked about this, but are you somebody who watches movies or listens to podcasts when you're working? I feel like you're a podcast person. Uh, both. Or music. Uh, it it kind of depends. Like I've, I've found, like if I'm drawing, I can watch movies. Hmm. But if I'm in 3D on the computer, I tend to be more like music or podcasts mm -hmm. and more music. Um, cause something that requires me to like pay attention to it, like a yeah. podcast, then I find like I'm concentrating pretty hard when I'm doing 3d stuff and I keep missing what's going on. I have to rewind on the podcast mm -hmm. while mm -hmm. music, I can just kind of zone out a little easier. Yeah. Yeah. Something more comfortable with in a way. Just don't have to worry about it. I'm going to jump over to this person. I'm going to save. I haven't saved in a while. Get this over here. Yeah. Uh, there's a question of what kind of music you listen to. I listen to a lot of different kinds of music. Um, I have been listening to lo fi channels lately just because my son turned me on to them. So I find mm -hmm. I have a uh, chilled cow playing quite a bit lately. Nice. But uh, Alex likes metal. I am very <laughs> into a lot of heavy music. So, uh, <clears throat> but uh, 
like Deftones, Tool, you know, would be two of my favorite bands, you know, but also mm -hmm. things like Floyd and Rush and a lot of that stuff as well. So, uh, so often on, you know, Spotify is awesome also for discovering music. So I've got a, like my liked playlist on Spotify is really long now, but it's a lot of bands. Like I couldn't tell you what their names are because I'm just liking songs and it's adding to the playlist, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it depends on the mood, you know, lately I've really been digging the lo-fi thing, although it kind of puts you to sleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I just want to sit on the couch and like, this look is at great. Our books. Yeah. See if I can get what about this, you? I listen to a lot of 80s and 90s rock, and then I also listen to a lot of country when I'm working. Basically, listen to like the Guardians listen, of the Galaxy you soundtrack. To country? Yeah, I listen to a lot of country, old country. All right, I'm going to log uh, off now. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to like Marty Robbins, which, if you don't know what that is, it's basically like old gun slinger ballads okay see so thank you shane marty robbins he knew uh yeah i'm a big fan i don't know i just like it quite a bit i turned i turned a lot of people onto marty robbins it's a very i don't know it, it's uh it's a different type of thing but I, I quite like it for sure um oh sorry question about i, I missed from hannibal and, and twitch this is the model uh, to make this all you would need to do is just kind of make a character they and then kind of chop it up and, and create different parts of it so you could make make this first then you could make a head and then you make a couple different versions of the head make a hand this one this one has been you know the hands are actual several different pieces so you could do that uh and then to just pose them and then prep them in a way like this uh, and this is it looks like the head up here that was started on from the very beginning, just this blank head that then was, was sculpted into these other versions. So uh, you could make this kit, kit yourself in a little time, but it's relatively simple geometry and relatively simple things to kind of put together. So uh, you could even maybe take a scan. You could get a scan of somebody and then start chopping it into several pieces uh, and go this way. So it's all free floating parts. I do listen to a lot of the Guardians of the Galaxy soundtracks, mostly like the awesome mixes, like whatever Peter Quill would listen to. Uh, I think in like my Spotify most played, like those things have been in my top playlists so many times, uh, like several years in a row since those movies came out. It's kind of like the, I don't know, I, li I like older music. I don't, listen to a ton of new stuff i do a little bit but not a not a lot when i was in high school and younger i listened to a lot of emo though a lot of emo screamo bands nice a lot of thursday if anybody remembers thursday i that don't that was my number one band for sure First to last, yep. Those are my favorites. Yeah, I see. I see all that emo screamo bands. Like, we're gonna get a list of of things that people listen to now in the chat for sure. Trying to keep the one of the, the struggles that I'm finding right now with this clay thick skin thing is like all these little details that I kind of had. And if I go too heavy with this clay texture, I'm going to lose them. So I'm trying to find a balance of how do I keep that, but not but still make it feel like clay. So I'm going to have to figure that out as I go. All right. I think this will work. Just kind of um, what I'm doing is I, I found that flow, like basically going in the direction of the flow of the form is actually working pretty good. So that and, and changing the size of your brush big, it'll do like these really large gestures, which more like affect a large shape. But if it's really tiny, you can kind of keep the, the detail there. So it's actually working pretty good. Oops. 
Oh, I am just browsing. Bridge libraries. Yeah, I haven't poked around Bridge in a little while, and so there's so many new things that are in here that look pretty cool. It definitely feels like something you kind of need to be kept up on. Like you come in, and you're like, "Oh, what's your what's like shopping here today?" Oh, this is what's cool. Nice is the integration between it and Maya is so easy now because like, mm. like I had a shelf in there that was like Mega Scans textures because you used mm -hmm. to have to when you exported from like Bridge to Maya, you had to re you had to create the shader. Mm -hmm. And now uh, automatically, the plugin when you uh, export from Bridge to Maya looks at what renderer you have set mm. redshift arnold whatever and then creates the shader and puts all the maps in all the right places so it's Did i know amazing. that that's awesome it's so awesome how new is that update uh it's been doing that for like the last, at least a year uh, as okay. far as building the shaders so mm -hmm. um but really is super super cool Somebody has a question. Uh, it says, you have the creature design book that's from 2012, and I mainly got it so that I could uh, piece through it for more technical info. Would it be OK for me to use this text to help me design in the current ZBrush, even if it is outmoded? The book was a hand down to you. You're brand new to ZBrush. OK. Um, I would definitely, I think you'll get some of the basics, meaning like how to interact with the software from that book. But I think there are there's going to be some better options for you if, about designing and understanding some of the new features, especially if you're playing. Uh, if the one you have right now or, or uh, the book you have is from 2012, that's a little old for this. Uh, just because you're not going to get stuff like Dynamesh, you're not going to get stuff like Remesh, you're not going to get stuff like Z Model or Spotlight, all those kind of things um, that are new. Looks like my zbrush just crashed speaking of so i'm going to go to your workflow there uh, but i would definitely play around with uh, something newer uh, finding a new thing to to learn that from i think i mean the workshop Nomen workshop does regularly updated intro to zbrush things there so you could check that out that's done every year. So yeah, yeah, so like the the new intro to ZBrush at the workshop is the current version of ZBrush. So yeah, intro to Maya, intro to ZBrush, we we up those I update those annually. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think 2012 is a little too far back. Yeah. For ZBrush, it's changed a bit since then. Mm -hmm. There's just so many new features, I think, is the biggest part for me. Like I think you're not gonna get full like you're not going to get everything you want. You're not going to take full advantage of the program. It's enough, I think, for you to understand how to load a tool and save a tool so you can use it for that. But it's not going to be as useful as I think you'd like it to be. Right. Good question, though. That's an interesting uh, thing just in general. I just Look at this. <laughs> well, mine just rebooted. So loading mine over here. Load it up. That hasn't happened to me in a while, believe it or not. <laughs> Let's That's use this funny red one. Yeah. Green. Uh, you say you're looking over gesture, establishing basic figures, forms, proportions. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's mostly about design, I mean, what is, is I don't know what the book looks like from twenty twelve. Um, what what is the? This is so hard to do over chat text, but what does the cover of the book look like? What's on it? I might know what the book looks like. Cybex creature design. Interesting. I'll look it up on my own side. I think it's this one. Yeah, I would it's just because oh, of how man, old it is. Been studying this stuff for twenty years since Maya one. Awesome. Ooh, cool. 
Yeah, it's weird that Maya's 20 years old. Yeah. Yeah. What is the old, this is a random piece of question that I don't know the answer to. What is the oldest software that's like still being used? Like Maya's 20 years old. Like how old is Photoshop? Photoshop, I started using Photoshop, I think it was version two or three in 1990. Three. So I'd okay. say Photoshop is probably the oldest one that I'm still using. This is AutoCAD. Yeah, AutoCAD's been around for a long time. But yeah, Photoshop it's, to... it's crazy that like it's like and over the last you know 25 years, it's like what you know, have you seen competitors to Photoshop pop up? And it's like, yeah, there's some free ones like sure. GIMP and these days obviously procreate for painting. Sure. But man, they've got a foothold with Photoshop, that's for sure. I think it just speaks to like how quick you you have to kind of update yourself a lot on on software, right? Like keeping up to date on what's new, what the cool things are. But there are still some that are like these players that have been around for quite a long time, you know, that are maintaining their their foothold in the, the industry, which is interesting, like like a Maya and like a Photoshop and like a, an AutoCAD even. Mm -hmm. So much change in the industry. I always have to be ready to learn some new softwares and new techniques and new tips and new, new things like there. This is a different experience sculpting than something that has like more features to it than the other ones that are very basic. A little harder to be, we were talking about this earlier, but it's a little harder to be looser when I have something that has like more of a clear design in it with this thick skin thing. Because so I like don't want to lose what I had. But I also want it to blend in, so... Trying to find a balance. Did your uh, did your Maya come back to life? Yeah, but since I was just messing around, I never saved. So oh yeah, it doesn't matter. It's always a bummer. Yeah, it's always a bummer though. It's like oh, all right, make something new. Make something it different. Was, it was it was a sign. Maya did yeah. not like what I was making. Yeah, of course, I already saved what I, even though it's a blank scene, like step one, give it a file yeah. name, save, yeah. get work. I think Maya is the program. I don't know how I was going to debate. ZBrush and Maya have both crashed on me. I feel like a thousand times each. I think at a certain point, you just get used to it. And you're like, well, okay, that's fine. We're moving on. Yeah, I mean, I think generally, not today, but generally I'm pretty good about saving. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I finish, you know, a project and if I go to the scenes directory, it's like usually it goes up to like version 50, version 70, version oh, 90. Oh, yeah. I just usually every few hours of work I save with a new version. Do you remember the ver the thing that you worked on that had the most versions? Hmm. Or what the highest number of versions you've ever done is. I have ish. no idea. But probably think, no more than 100. What about you? I think mine is 367. Damn. When I worked on my first when I worked on my first Iron Man suit, I was like I mean I, I was so paranoid about losing work <laughs> that I was like I'm saving like every 20 minutes. That's awesome. So was, I had so many of those files and they're like all especially near the end they get somewhat heavy. So it's like, you know, 80 to 100 megs per save. I, I had like a whole hard drive that was just those. But yeah, that's what's the, the longest time you've so important, though. Oh, yeah. Well, somebody asked, what's the longest you have spent on a single project? Uh, for me, it's probably six months on a single like character single project i would guess 
For work or personal? For work, not for personal. Okay. And this, yeah. that's like not 100% full time. Sometimes it's bouncing back and forth to other things. I think yeah, six months. Like, yeah, personal, usually not more than a month, but you know, because mm -hmm. it's, if it's something being done in the free time and you're kind of going back to it back and forth. But uh, professional, obviously, I think it's like if you're on work in commercials where everything's got a three week mm. deadline, then it's going to basically be like that. Yeah. But if you're in film, especially if you're in the art department on a big budget movie, mm -hmm. then, you know, months can go by. I mean, I think Neville, I think was in the art department for avatar for what, four years, the first avatar. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there aren't that many creatures in avatar. So if you really do the math, right. <laughs> Like how many, uh, much time is per creature or was, yeah. So many revisions. I mean, it's like, I was only on it for six months and it was, uh, I mean, I probably spent at least a couple of those months just on that Banshee, the flying dragon mm -hmm. thing. Because mm -hmm. it kept getting adjusted. Right, always being changed and updated and different needs for it. Getting there. Just trying to be loose and destroy this mesh, I guess, a little bit. Sometimes it's like the the quicker you do this, it actually looks better. And it's like trying to control this thick skin thing is interesting. It's like you shouldn't try to, I guess. Just embrace it. I think I saw somebody was kind of chatting about Avatar in the chat. I think I saw Avatar nine times in theaters. Yeah, that's impressive. That's, I think the most I've ever seen any film in theaters. But I remember that was the movie. When did Avatar come out? 2009? 2008, I think. 2008, 2000. So I was going to, I was going to know to, Somebody says 2009 in the chat. I can't read your name because it's a really dark blue. But uh, 2009, 2008 was when I was going to Noman. So oh, for yeah. me, I think that was like the pinnacle of like, and it was such a big change in the visual effects industry too, of of like how was it being done, such a different production, but how much digital effects were being done at that time and in, in that movie. Mm-hmm. So that was also like trying to break down those that movie and like when you when you really get in like to when you're kind of learning uh, in school there's like this these times where you're everything you watch is like you're evaluating it yeah. so you're like how did they do this how did they do like these scenes what were you know, what was the techniques they were using and so I was really into that at the time and I, I think probably only one maybe two three times that i watched avatar just to like enjoy it and the other six times i watched it to like really like with like a, a calculating like how how is this happening it was one of those movies that was just super new and exciting i'm excited for the sequels yeah me too i'm super curious because it's like what a billion dollar budget well yeah it would have to be, I'd imagine, because they're doing it them all at the same it's, time. It's, it's something like a billion dollars. I mean, it's it, that's, that's for like insane. four movies. Yeah. So, because I think the budget was approved for all the sequels at the same time. Mm -hmm. So crazy. Some somebody's saying the movie they saw the most in theaters was Starship Troopers. I think you can see I that love in theaters. That movie. I really like that movie. It's one of my favorites. It's so hilarious. It still <laughs> so, holds up too. And it's so graphic. Oh yeah. The effects kind of hold up though. Much like Jurassic Park. I think they, they actually hold up pretty well. I think that kind of speaks to, you know, I mean, that's a, a Phil Tippett movie too. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Somebody says Jurassic Park or Equilibrium were the movies they saw the most in an actual theater. 
Equilibrium. That's an interesting one. I don't think I saw that in theaters. I don't think I've seen Equilibrium. I think that's the one with Christian Bale, right? Isn't that like the Gun Kata one? So are they Christian Bale and Sean Bean? I feel like are in a movie together. They say yes. I got it. Nice. Uh, I am sculpting, Ryan. Hello, Ryan. How are you doing? Good to see you here. I'm sculpting some some uh, monsters and creatures for the scene. I'll, I'll take off solo mode in just a second. Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, man. That was for me. Going to going to the, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Not the Hobbit ones, but the Lord of the Rings ones. It was my first really big movie-going experience. Where I, like, it was a lot of like, like lining up to go to the theater. And people in costumes and doing midnight showings, and uh, that was my first time really doing that. I think that was one of my favorites. Uh, I have really fond memories of the Fellowship of the Ring for sure. Yeah, those movies were absolutely amazing. We uh, we actually so watch them almost every time. year. Yeah, me too. So, I mean, I, I think when uh, when I started Nomen in '97, you know, they were, you know, ramping up at, at and mm -hmm. you know, Weta was still, you know, not a household name. Mm -hmm. And this guy uh, Jason that I worked with at Alias before Nomen went over to uh, New Zealand to work there, and he, uh, this is maybe just like a couple, like three to six months after starting Nomen, and he pinged me saying like, "We're hiring like crazy, so you know, if mm -hmm. you want to." work on Lord of the Rings and move to New Zealand, you should apply. And yeah. I just remember just being like, <laughs> like, I mean, I was just like, there's no way, like I just started Nomen. So it was, it was, it was, it was Bad tough timing. though, because like I, I just to realize that that was like a once in a lifetime thing. And then the, the movies were so amazing and everybody who yeah. worked on them, what an amazing experience that must have been. And just between what a digital, what a workshop, the quality, the passion. Like I think for anybody mm -hmm. who worked on those movies, that's just got to be such an amazing memory. Oh yeah, I think it'd be just you know it's a one it's in a lifetime thing. Like those movies come out one time, and they they have such a big cultural impact. Part of it too. There's only so many of those that happen, you know every every decade. Um, let's see what kind of we got some questions coming in from a VFX perspective. I was told by someone in the industry that Spielberg plus Cruise War of the Worlds really changed how production was done. Is that true? Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Alex, do you know about that? I don't know about that. <clears throat> uh, from what perspective? Yeah, and they don't say. Uh, if you want to expand on that, we're happy to try to answer. Yeah, the one movie I know had a huge, uh, represented a big paradigm shift was Lost in Space, mm -hmm. which is doesn't really hold up all that great. But uh, but Lost in Space was uh, kind of like a first kind of well marketed relatively decent budget effects film that uh, most of the effects were done in London. Okay. And so that represented like a big thing because prior to Lost in Space, which came out in, I forget, like 98, 99, most things were ILM. Most mm -hmm. things were done, you know, big budget things were ILM. And as computers got more expensive and Windows NT came out and software started dropping, like, you know, some places that were only doing commercials in, in London wanted to enter film and Lost in Space, instead of being going to the credits and seeing one big studio like ILM or Sony Imageworks, it was just like this scrolling list of all these smaller studios. And it was like writing of the on the wall of like, mm -hmm. this is coming, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot, an explosion of growth of small VFX studios that are going to be able to actually do film quality work. Right, right. Yeah, that's so interesting. I think, you know, when we look at like what the VFX industry is now, just the amount of shots that are in a film now, even from what it was 10 years ago, is insane. Like, oh, it's, for sure. there's so many shots in a movie now. It's it's absolutely crazy. 
I'm going to bop over to your stream. Looks like you're setting up another kind of plane and a character there. Yeah, just trying to sort of rebuild where I was at before and then just going to start plopping in things and sort of see where I end up. Mm -hmm. So when you're kind of starting at this point, are you looking for like initial light direction? You've got like a foreground-ish elements here, so. Yeah, I mean, it's the same thing where I've got foreground, middle ground, background. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just for speed for the time we have, I'm just using a mega scan texture that has displacement as opposed to jumping to ZBrush and doing what I was doing earlier, which is like mm -hmm. hand sculpt it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at this point, it's just kind of playing around with stuff without any specific direction. I think I'm going to probably yeah. try and import some trees and plants and see if I can end up somewhere. Ooh. I'm just going to import some rocks and things just to break it up so everything doesn't look like the same texture. Yeah. Oh, we got a question about VR. Uh, another question about industrial design programs like Rhino, Fusion 3D, SolidWorks, etc. Uh, can those programs land you a job in games? Uh, I would wager no. I think that in games, you know, some of those you can those programs can be used to make cool elements of a model or something like that. But if you're wanting to work in games very likely you're going to have to know Maya or 3ds Max or something like that to that's what you're going to be exporting out of and importing out of so at the minimum you would need to know those as well as one of the other programs that you're talking about um, so I don't know if that helps but uh, they're not super well used in the games industry none of the industrial design programs are um, but then we had the question about VR uh, I've played a little bit with VR I have a, a oculus quest. Uh, which is somewhere over here behind me. But um, I like using Gravity Sketch. It was the first program that I used in VR that felt freeing, like I could sketch anywhere and do anything. I haven't, I did try for a little while to integrate it into my kind of pipeline, but it was a little clunky. Uh, so I personally would be excited to uh, play with it like Medium. Because Medium, I've been watching Geo's stuff. He did a stream for us a couple months ago. Uh, it seems like a really cool way to sculpt, to be able to have it like in front of you. But I haven't played with it too much. Alex, have you played much with VR? No, I haven't. I want to, but I, I really haven't yet. Yeah. Seems cool, though. Oh, it's awesome. I mean, Geo's stuff is super, super cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I've played a few games, but I haven't really tried the 3D stuff as far as... Yeah, I heard Half, uh, Half-Life Alex was amazing, but I never got into it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Alex Nice was telling us about that. Yeah, he was saying it was like the best VR game that's that's ever come out. So I definitely want to try it, and it seems like there's a lot of cool stuff there. VR is an interesting... The thing with VR for me, there's two things. One is the headsets are kind of heavy right now. And two, as a person who wears glasses all the time, most of them, the time they're really large glasses like this, they don't fit in the headsets. So I have to switch glasses and then they like, they pinch my head. So I, have to, I just like can't wear the headset for very long. Yeah, I definitely found that after like a couple hours, I was just kind of like a little, like just sort of sweaty and. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my, the thing I didn't like about it. I also know that when I'm wearing it, like anybody around me just looks is probably watching me. Like I feel like I should be in a private space when I do VR. <laughs> it just feels, you know, like just the person who's like doing kind of this thing. But yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, I've definitely seen videos on YouTube of people messing with people that have VR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's like I don't know if I want to be the person that gets messed with. Granted, I'm doing it at my home with, you know. Nobody to hear, but it's still, I don't know, it's a weird thing. It's very isolating, but you can totally get sucked into it, though, at the same time. 
Uh, w Reality from Twitch is asking, what kind of things do you study now at this point in your careers? Um, that's a good question. We were kind of talking about this earlier, you know, things that we'd be interested in learning. Uh, for both of us, we both pointed to Unreal as mm -hmm. being like a tool set or a render or whatever game engine that you want to speak about it as. Um, definitely something I'm interested in and Alex is as well. Uh, but I don't know about uh, yeah. other things that you're studying or that you that you work on. I mean, I think you're 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 always kind of absorbing. That never stops. So studying, I think the idea of when I was younger, it was like, you know, oh, I'm an art student, so I'm studying and eventually mm -hmm. I'll be a professional. And then I think once you kind of get older, you get kind of realize that you're kind of always a student and you're always learning. So mm -hmm. Every movie you see, every book you read, every game you play is, is input that's somehow going to affect you. Yeah. And some of those things will affect you more than others, where then you're going to want to evaluate what it was about that thing that you thought was cool and impressive. Um, but like, you know, things like anatomy, design, like you're just always going to feel like you have so much more to learn about that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. I feel. Yeah, I spend a lot of time thinking about composition and color and mood and tone and story now. Mm -hmm. That's that's yeah. something that when I was going to school, it wasn't my main focus. You know, it was more foundation. You know, those are also foundation things, but it was like anatomy. Spending a lot of time on anatomy. Spending a lot of time in how to do the tools, how to get comfortable with tools. Mm -hmm. So I found that the further you know into my career, the more I focus on. In some ways, it's I'm focusing more on other foundational skills that I hadn't really brushed up on, right? Right? Or I didn't, I didn't have the time to focus on, or something like that. Um, you know, it's like composition is a very basic thing, but you can spend decades on composition and still, you know, find new things about it or how to how to do it. And I think that that's that's for me the things that are exciting is something that's super deep. That you can really play with for a long time, but I also want to learn Unreal. <laughs> uh, we got another supporter for you and Unreal in the chat. Ryan Hawkins says that you and Unreal would be fire. So I, th I think uh, you got to get in there. I would totally love to. I know. Yeah, I mean, for sure, watching that. Uh, Medieval Village over the weekend. Yeah. I mean, you can't not watch that as an environment artist and want to get into Unreal if you're not using it. You know, and the renderer, obviously, you know, what you're capable of doing on a GPU is getting better and better. So like to me, Unreal stuff still looks like Unreal stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it's it's a little easier to get a photo real result out of like Arnold or, or Redshift or V-Ray because there's so many optimizations you need to do in Unreal to get it to look more realistic. Mm -hmm. So I think it depends on like what style of rendering you're looking for. Right. But uh, what is your thought? And this is just came up in the, the chat, just the one word, but meta humans. Uh, I mean, that was obviously an amazing demo and looks sure. super, super cool. So a lot of people have been talking about that and a lot of people have been raising the same question that comes up a lot, which is like, you know, does that mean people aren't going to have to model characters anymore? Right. And, you know, just like how when photogrammetry came out, every became a thing, everybody's like, are people not going to have to model props anymore? Um, and it's super, super cool and super impressive. I'm sure it's going to mm -hmm. get used a ton for people that are using Unreal and need background characters. Oh, yeah. But For hero sure. characters are always going to have to follow a more normal pipeline of design it, sculpt it in ZBrush, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what the tool set is to integrate new designs into that or how, how you could. Because I think that's something like, uh, let's say you're making a stylized game. Mm -hmm. How useful is that to you in stylized? Maybe there's a whole stylized, you know, I could see Epic doing a whole stylized pack of characters that you can blend between, but then you're still working within their 
sets that they're giving you. It, to me, it's very much like you're saying, like photogrammetry or, or mega scans or all these other things that are, that are fantastic for creators and it speeds up the pipeline and kind of allows you to do other things that you wouldn't normally have been able to do or, or, or would take a lot more work. But it's not going to replace anything specifically, I don't think, because there's always going to be that kind of curated experience you want to have as a you know a game director or a studio you know and so i think it'll be used a ton absolutely and i think it'll i think it'll actually help smaller studios that might not have the the you know, the resources or the manpower to to make all that other stuff to make background stuff i think you're going to see a lot of a lot of things that used to be smaller budget or more indie appear and look a lot better than they did you know, but I don't know if it's going to replace making characters. It's just, there's too many, you know, to use, you know, any big budget film or big budget thing. Like you're always going to want to make sure that, you know, your, your master chief looks like your master chief, right? Yeah. It doesn't have options for that. But for faces, you know, it's just the problem sure. is costume, you know, like a huge, I mm -hmm. mean, uh, you could say that 90% of character design is costume design, and that's where MetaHumans is not going to, you know, at this point be able to do the, you know, you get a specific costume design that's done, you know, by a concept artist. That's still going to mm -hmm. need to be modeled by scratch from scratch, whether it's marvelous okay. designer or whatever. Yeah, it's still going to do it in that way. You know, just like look at movies, like, you know, a regular movie can go to prop houses and buy costumes and rent all the costumes they want. And yet lots of movies don't mm -hmm. do that. Lots of movies have a costume designer and departments that are actually hand making all the costumes. And the reason is because it, they want something that's very specific to that project, especially when you get into fantasy and sci-fi. Mm -hmm. And many games are fantasy and sci-fi. Like there's a lot of realistic games too, but you know, like your Last of Us or, you know, your Uncharted's, but even those have you know, fantastical elements to them. And those are also somewhat, somewhat stylized as well. Just kind of, yeah, I, I think it's an awesome thing, but I don't think it'll replace anything. And also a lot of faces are already being scanned anyways. Like those are all scanned heads from what I'm aware. So that's already a, a pipeline that's already happening in games. You know, you're gonna scan it. You'll scan actors. You'll scan, you know, for for background and hero characters. That was already a pipeline that was happening. So this is just really making it more easy and accessible for people who wouldn't have access to to all the money it would take you to do that. There we go. You got an environment. It's uh, rocks, plants, trees, and a VDB <laughs> copied a couple of times. Yeah, but it's working. Just rendering it out so I can see it a little better. A little bigger. Yeah, it's relatively low res render settings just so it renders super fast. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, but yeah, blocking things out, I mean, it, it can go pretty fast. Yeah, I mean, you you had a crash about 20 minutes ago, 30 minutes ago, and <laughs> lost everything. So I'd say, you know, to come up with something in 30 minutes with your your workflow is pretty fast. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, th I think that, you know, a useful thing with blocking out an environment is that the ground, you know, it's like eventually going to get covered with lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's like just blocking out a ground randomly with random brush strokes. Nature is so random that you can be really random with the way you work and it still kind of can look okay as long as you're focusing on composition. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, as far as, you know, you can put if you, a texture on the ground and just repeat it. And it'll look like a repeating texture, but once you block cover that up with plants and rocks and stuff, the repeating texture becomes less noticeable because you're covering it up. Right. You know, so it's kind of like I'd, I'd wait until I get to a point that I feel like that okay, I'm pretty much blocked out in the scene with the stuff that's going to be in there, and then look around to see if there's areas where I need to retexture or 
you know, something that looks blurry or looks pixelated or whatnot. Mm -hmm. You know, I can see that the displacement map on this, you know, geo needs to be, you know, I need to increase the amount of tessellation or I might not like something on a shader. But, uh, but it's fun to, you know, part of this is having the library, having the trees and the VDBs and obviously this cool texture that's on the ground here, I just grabbed from Bridge, you know, and mm -hmm. anybody can go and grab Bridge. You know, it is, uh, it's free for Unreal users. You know, if you use something like Maya, you do have to pay a little bit to download things. I forget the pricing. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's amazing though, that if you use Unreal, it's 100% free. Yeah, absolutely. But, all of these shaders, all of these models, all of these assets that are also well made are free. Yeah, it's all there for you to use. It's kind of shocking. You're like, oh, this is so easy to use, and and Unreal's free. So every every part of it is free if you want to get into it. Increase the render settings just so it looks a little cleaner. Absolutely. Do you increase your renders and do yours? I'm going to jump over to this man who's mid run. I've kind of been sculpting these background characters here and just getting them all up to the same kind of quality of, of sort of clay vibes. So I'm kind of getting getting close ish to a place. Oh, oh I haven't cool. used any of these. I haven't used any of these clays. Oh, there we go. This is kind of a nice. I haven't used this clay mat cap in a very long time. It actually looks pretty good with this. To like kind of get that uh kind of look, probably render this in Keyshot at some point or some other program to kind of do this kind of a thing. Taking all these, you can see I like more of the anatomy and kind of getting these ones over here so that they're all play like. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of like sculpting in the scene sometimes too, just to kind of see the whole thing, like what's important, what's what's not important, what's going to be there, what's not going to be there. Bouncing around from one to the other. Kind of fun, actually. This is the this is why I got all that prep work out of the way because now I can just bounce around to whatever is the most fun, like in the moment. Like, oh, I want to work on this for a minute, and I want to work for this one for a minute. Did I finish the creature from last week? No, I did not finish the creature from last week. I'll show you where that lint ended up, though. It was at a decently resolved state. I didn't. I, I think it's kind of at the point now where I'd want to get into like uh, the textures of it a little bit more. I'll switch back to a different mat cap. But I had kind of done this creature last week. From, uh, just a bunch of spheres. So I think the design is mostly there. Um, I think I still need to figure out the eyes, figure out what my plan is with that. But, yeah, this one's pretty close ish. I just need to detail it. All right. Uh, yeah, in the in our chats, you're going to see that we're getting we're posting some uh, upcoming events. So we're going to have this Friday uh, a kind of 2D to 3D or, or yeah, I guess 3D draw 3D sculptures from 2D drawings with uh, Leticia. Uh, Leticia is also a Nomen grad, Nomen alum, and I think she's working at Disney or Netflix now. She just moved around, but she's awesome. Does a lot of really cool stylized character character work and is much worked on a bunch of cool stuff like overwatch uh, and the crudes too she just worked on that so uh, she'll be on our stream this uh coming friday so check that out and she'll be making some some sculpts from 2d drawings so if you're interested in kind of characters that pipeline of, of seeing how you would start a character from a 2d concept either that you drew or somebody else drew uh, she'll be covering that so check that one out she's awesome she's super talented uh, so take a look at that for sure. We have five minutes left on our stream. So if there's any last questions, uh, get them in now, and we'll try to answer them before we head out. Yeah, I'll scan the – just turned on depth of field, so now I'm just uh, – Oh, there you go. Yeah. Render. Oh, 
There's a question about Noman portfolios. Does Noman have anything against people using textures and assets for Quixel uh, for people making their portfolio? Portfolio for Noman? Uh, they don't sp or for specifically say. I mean, we yeah. could answer it both ways. I mean, for for Noman, ideally not. But for for a job, I think it's like it depends what position you're applying for. You know, if you're getting a job as a lighter, then sure. You know, uh, lighting, compositing, and you're using mega scans and kit bash just to, so you have geometry to light, then that makes total sense. You know, I would definitely suggest it. But if you're applying for a job as a modeler, then I would severely limit how much you use, you know, uh, kit bash models made by other people in your portfolio because that'll can confuse recruiters and people that are looking at your work. You know, um, and then with texturing, texturing using mega scans is okay, but you also want to show your ability to texture something from from scratch because right. and and layering and blending and, and what you can do with substance or Mari. So yeah, it's, it's like, all about like what's an what asset. Position. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like, if you're like a concept artist, then you know your ability to block things out with kit bash and paint on top of it. You know, it's, it's so. It really depends. I yeah, think in production, tool. it doesn't matter. Like that, you know, what you do in production is a whole different story because there's no such thing as cheating in production and everything's just got a deadline and it's got to get done and people are going to do whatever they need to do. But when you're interviewing for a job, they need to know what you're capable of and your and your portfolio needs to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Don't confuse them. And I think that's one thing, If especially if you don't, if you use... Like let's say you're being an environment artist for games or for film or something, uh, and you put mega scans in your portfolio. You first off, call it out so that people know that you're using it. And because it, if you don't, somebody might see it and they're going to be like, "Oh, that's mega scans," and then they're going to ask a question, which is, "How much of the rest of your portfolio is mega scans?" <laughs> right. So I think it's okay to put it in there every now and then, even to show layout, but definitely show you can do it from scratch. That's that's the big part of the job is being able to. Yeah, for sure. I can't believe it's already almost one o'clock. It goes by quick. Dude. Well, I have to say I was, you know, a little a little nervous at the beginning. So <laughs> but in the end it's like, all right, that was cool. Yeah, you just kinda have fun and make some stuff. Yeah, so I, I hope uh, definitely appreciate everybody who watched. So hopefully yeah. it was hopefully it was interesting. Yeah, I, I think seeing your process with the shelves and just the, your 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 thought that you put into before the project, I think is any any project is a really interesting thing that most people don't necessarily talk about as much because it's about you know you're prepping to do something. How can you do that easily and quickly and yeah, I think your your shelves and stuff. I personally would love to see you. I've already told you this, but get into some of your uh, Inktober stuff and start building those in three D. I think that'd be a fun process to watch. Uh, yeah, I'd, so. love, I'd love that. To I need to get uh, started with that, and maybe these streams are a good way to do it. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. Yeah. I think it's the pressure of like, do I need to constantly be talking <laughs> as opposed to? That's the challenge. Yeah. Um. Because sometimes I just need to concentrate, and then I, you know, I guess that's what's awesome about there being two of us is that sure. if I need to zone out, then you can do your thing. So yeah, so thanks for having me on. Of course, thank you for being here. You got a yeah. couple people saying you should come back, and I think they everybody would love to see you work on a bigger project or or show us the steps of a project as you kind of make your way through it. So I think that'd be great. Uh, awesome piece, by the way, just throwing that super quickly together in 20 minutes. I'm still over here uh, noodling on all of my clay men. So awesome. they'll, they'll eventually get there, but I've, I've got some of them in progress, which is cool. Uh, awesome. Uh, thank you, Alex, for being here. Thank you for doing the stream. And uh, thank you to everybody again who watched. Uh, again, check out the stream this Friday, and we'll be here again doing Art Jam next Wednesday. We do them every Wednesday, having special guests uh, throughout the rest of the year, hopefully. So uh, yeah, thanks again. And again, 
10 to 1 Art Jam, and then this coming Friday to check out the event for Leticia on the same stream, whether you're watching on Facebook, YouTube, uh, or Twitch. It will be available on all of those. So, all right, everybody, have a great rest of your day, and have uh, have a good week, and we'll see you next week. See ya. All right. Thanks, man. Bye. Later.